Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer. And today we are doing a true crime marathon. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure Please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would like to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. All right, let's go ahead and get into this video. So the idea for this video is something that I've had in my head for a while, and I was surprised to learn that a lot of you were interested in a compilation video like this, which is rad that this is something that we can sort of relate to. Part of my reasoning in creating my first compilation video is that I personally have an issue with silence, and I found through the comments that a lot of you shared this issue. So for me, I pick a podcast episode or the longest YouTube video I can find for my com comfort, comfort? comfort YouTuber, and I just have it playing in the background of my life throughout the entire day. With that said, I know that for some of you, I am your comfort YouTuber, which is absolutely crazy to me. I know I said that last video, but it is true. I will never understand it. And thank you to all of you who are consistently watching. So if you have an issue with silence, or maybe you just want a long video to put on while you fall asleep at night, or a long video to play for your dog while you leave the house to run errands, anything like that, this is for you. Now, with all that said, come gather around and let me tell you the wild survival story of Danielle Keener and Daniel Zapp. Now, I want to start this video off with a quote. This is a quote from Danielle herself, and this kind of gives you her mindset around what happened to her and Daniel. She said, and I quote, we are not victims. We are survivors. Our story begins on January 7th of the year 2000 at about 4.45 p.m. just outside of York, Pennsylvania. And this is where three men were out duck hunting and fishing near the Susquehanna River. It was here that a man named Dean who went by Pete was just hanging out with his friends, you know, chilling, not killing, when he looked out into the river into the distance and he saw two forms. He wasn't really sure what he was looking at, so he just kind of watched them as they floated closer to him. And as he looked, he started to realize that what he was seeing was the, were the forms of two people. And as he got closer still, he heard a voice calling out to him. So he walked out into the water, he got close, and he realized that what he was seeing was a teenage boy who was grabbing onto a teenage girl. So he grabbed the boy's hand and he pulled both of them out onto the shore. Neither of the kids could talk. They were both shaking violently, and it was very clear that they had been through hell. Pete could tell just by looking at them that both of these kids had been shot in the head, and that if he didn't get them help soon, they weren't going to make it. He actually thought that even if he did get them help soon, that they probably weren't going to survive. And this was 18-year-old Danielle Keener and her friend 18-year-old Daniel Zapp. So who were Danielle and Daniel? Danielle, who went by Danny, was a kind-hearted and genuine girl who was said to have a great personality. And she was an 18-year-old freshman at Susquehanna University, and she was on a second date with Danielle Zapp, who was a college freshman also, but from another university, the Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Now, Daniel, who went by Dan, was the eldest of three children and was from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And he was said to be a real down-to-earth guy, a solid and mature person who played soccer, ran cross-country, and performed in the school theater. Dan and Danny met through mutual friends a couple of months into their freshman college experience, and the two really hit it off. They like went to dinner, and they found that they had a ton in common and like a lot to talk about. So they actually spent the better part of four months getting to know each other online because they were kind of you know long distance, and they found that they were really into each other. They were super compatible. They had a lot of chemistry. Their date when they went out to dinner went super well, so they were going to be getting together again and going on their second date, and Danielle was super, super stoked about this. The day of their abduction and attempted murder, Dan was actually on winter break from school. So he decided that he was going to take that opportunity to make the drive from his school to her school. I think it was like a two hour drive so that they could hang out and see each other and spend some time together since this is a girl that he was developing some pretty strong feelings for, right? So he gets there, they hang out and they decide that they're going to go on like a little Saturday, Saturday, uh, that word got lost in my mouth, Saturday afternoon date. Sounds so pure, except obviously it's not. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it today. So Danny and Dan didn't really have a plan for their date. Like they went out on their date, but they didn't really have a plan of what they were going to do. So they actually headed to a nearby boat launch um, where they knew that they could go and walk near the water. And this was by Three Mile Island in 
Goldsboro, which was Danny's hometown. So they're walking around, they're picking up stones that they can throw them in the river and try to skip them across the river. They're talking about their day, they're catching up, they're talking about meeting some friends of Danny's at a mall later, like a totally normal day until it wasn't. So they're there, they're hanging out, and about 15 minutes after they get there, a maroon truck pulls up, and inside the truck there's a man, and there is a Rottweiler named Sam. So the guy gets out, and he's like, hey, do you mind, like, if I let my dog get out? You know, because he's a big dog, and kids, you know, being considerate, or so you would think. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's totally fine. So the man and his dog get out, and Sam, the dog, goes and starts splashing around the water, being an adorable dog, as adorable dogs are. And while that's happening, the man and Dan and Danny start making small talk and speaking to one another, and the guy starts asking questions like how old they were and where they lived and what school they went to all that jazz and they were being nice and they were you know answering his questions but they could tell that he was like clearly intoxicated because he asked them the same questions over and over and he also had like some red droopy drunk looking eyeballs once Sam the dog was finished playing, the man took his dog and he put him in his truck and he was about to drive off. But before he drove off, he asked them like, hey, do you guys need a ride anywhere? To which they politely declined. And so he drove off and it seemed totally normal. He seemed like a totally normal guy. It seemed like a totally normal interaction. He, although he was like a little bit drunk, he wasn't like unfriendly. He drove off and they continued to walk next to the water. The two didn't notice at first that as they were walking by the water, the man had actually turned his truck around and had started following them. He was driving super, super slowly behind them and then would pass them. He actually passed them a couple of times. And in one instance, he was starting to pass them and going super slow. And then he saw like a police car nearby. So he sped off and it noticing that this guy was kind of hanging around and driving super slow and making them uncomfortable. They felt like the vibes were off and they decided that it was time for them to leave. Unfortunately, though, before they got a chance to actually leave, the man came back. He drove his truck up next to the right of them. And from there, things happened super fast. He ended up pulling his truck um, like in front of them and blocking their path. And he got out with a gun. He pointed a nine millimeter at them and was like, get in the fucking truck. And they knew immediately that he was serious. I mean, he does have a gun. And they also knew that there was nothing they could do because to one side of them was the water. And to the other side of them, there was a steep hill. So they couldn't even run. It didn't feel real to them. It felt like a nightmare. And Dan did everything he could. He pled with the man. He offered him money. He offered him his wallet, which the man did take. He offered him his car, his car keys. He offered him his laptop that was in his car. And the man was not interested. He was not interested in their possessions. He wanted to take them. So he ordered them to get in the truck. And at first he ordered both of them to get in the back of the truck because it was like a truck, but it had like a camper, like a shell. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. But then he changed his mind and he actually told Dan to get in the back by himself with, with Sam the dog, obviously, because Sam was going to, you know, be a very serious guard dog and watch him, even though he was like a super nice dog, they said. But he ordered Dan to get in the back, and they had Danny get in the front with him. Once in the truck, the guy takes off. Now, keep in mind, this is something that kind of blew my mind. When I was picturing this in my head as I was reading through the whole case the first time, I was picturing this happening at night. You know what I mean? Because this feels like very much a nighttime thing to do. But I was reading an old York Daily Record article, like a newspaper clipping newspapers.com, the best resource ever. And it's had like a timeline of this case in there. And this abduction happened at like 3.30 p.m. Isn't that crazy? I don't know what it is about that little fact, like picturing this happening in broad daylight, but it like destroyed my brain. Anyways, while they were in the truck and they were driving, it felt like they were driving for ever and all the while the kidnapper was scaring the shit out of Danny. So she's sitting there in the passenger seat, her knees like up to her chest because she's got her feet on a case of beer because again, this guy's hammered. He has a case of beer in his car. He's just getting drunk and he's driving with one hand. He's pointing a gun at her with the other and he is just ranting and raving, talking about the fact, that, the fact, talking about the fact, saying to her that the reason that the two of them have been abducted is because there were some men who were paying him, like a group of people who were paying him because of something that her father did, which spoiler alert, that was determined to be a lie. And then he was saying that like there was a bad drug debt and they were being taken as like collateral damage. And again, the lie detector determined that was a lie. He just kept rambling on and on. And then, oh my God, this part like destroys me. So they're driving, right? And during this ordeal, they actually drive by Danny's house, okay? And in her front yard is her 16-year-old brother, Michael, and her stepdad. So she sees them and they see her. Her brother looks right at her and she decides that she wants to try to like get his attention without being obvious. So she waves at him strangely with just one finger, something that like she would never do, hoping that he'd see it and think it was weird. And apparently he did see it and thought it was a little bit strange. He's like, what is she doing? But he didn't think anything really of it and ended up thinking that she was just waving at him. So he just waved back. 
Now, this is horrible, but this guy is an absolute monster. So during the 90 minutes that these two were with this man, because that's how long they were with him from the moment they were abducted to the time he tried to kill them. As he was driving, he stopped the truck twice on the 12 mile stretch, because it was a 12 mile stretch of road that he drove from point A to point B. And both times he stopped that truck, he ordered Danny to perform oral sex on him. And each time he told her that if she did it, she, he would let them go. And he also told her that if she didn't do it, he was going to shoot her. So this is happening and Dan is in the back and he knows something's going on, right? And he even tries to look a couple of times to see what's going on. And each time he would, the, the kidnapper would tell Danny to tell Dan to get down. So he's back there knowing full well what's happening to her up there and he can't do anything about it. And what's really messed up is he had his cell phone on him and he said he was trying to call 911, but he couldn't get service, which I mean, it is the 2000s and cell phones are so different. I know now I'm pretty sure you can always get through to 911. I think I have not needed to, thankfully, but he couldn't do anything. And I guess while he was back there, he was also looking around and he saw an aluminum bat and was like, oh, I could like stuff it in my jacket and try to attack this guy. But he thought it was too risky of a move since he had a gun, so he couldn't do anything. And it just feels like such a hopeless situation. So they keep driving and finally the man turns left onto this uh, dirt road. This was Gut Road near East Manchester Township. And he stopped the truck next to the Susquehanna River and again ordered Danny to give him oral sex. And she just kept crying and begging him to let them go and to let them like be safe. And she said like she would do whatever he wanted. Once there, he orders the kids out of the truck and they're standing by the water and he's like being really erratic. They're standing there and he's pacing back and forth with a gun in his hand, talking about how he didn't know what he was going to do because he, you know, they had seen his face and all the while he's shooting off rounds like with the gun into the water behind them. The two of them are just huddled into each other, terrified. And Danny's sitting there realizing with each shot that this guy could kill them. He could take their lives right then if he wanted to. And she's just terrified, wondering what she could do to stop this man from killing her and Dan. After terrorizing these two for a while by the water, he orders them back into the truck. Once in the truck, it's Dan in the back again, him in the driver's seat and Danny in the passenger seat. He turns to her and he says to her, so you said you would do anything. And it's at that moment that Danny knew that she was going to be raped and there wasn't anything she could do about it. So she just sat there and stared straight ahead and nodded her head because she knew that this was going to happen. And it's just, it sounds so, it's just, I can't imagine being in that situation. She just says that she didn't want to die and she didn't want Dan to die because of her. So then he did. He raped Danny in the front of that truck while Dan had to stay in the back knowing full well what was going on, but do it, not being able to do anything about it. And one report I read, but it was only one report, so I don't know if this is, you know, accurate, said that this man was not able to perform. So he stopped at some point and ordered her to just perform oral on him again. Once he was finished assaulting Danny, he ordered both of them out of the truck again and told them to walk towards the water. The two grabbed hold of one of each other and complied. While they walked, Danny was just praying. She hoped that he had got, gotten like what he wanted from her and he'd let the two of them go. But then she heard a gunshot. And at first she thought the guy was just shooting rounds off in the water again, like he had before. But then Dan fell to the ground. He fell on the ground right in front of her and blood started to come out of his mouth. And she said at that moment, she knew she was next. She knew that if Dan had been shot, she was going to be shot. So there wasn't even use of trying to run. So instead she just dropped to her knees next to Dan to see if he was okay. And the two told each other that they loved each other and they said their goodbyes. And it was at that moment that everything went black for Danny. She said that she never felt any pain. She just felt like a lot of pressure in her head, kind of like a big explosion. And she said right after that, she fell straight into the water. And once she was in the water, he shot her again in her like upper thigh near her groin. The next thing she remembered, she was waking up in the river and her body was totally numb. She said all she could remember was like kind of spitting things out of her mouth. And it was at that point that she realized that she had either been shot in the head or in the mouth. So she's laying there in this river, unable to move, totally numb. And she starts praying harder than she ever prayed in her entire life. But this time she's just praying for God to take her. Shortly after that, she saw Dan in the river and to her amazement, he was somehow alive. So the two laid there and kind of floated to each other and held on to each other. But once they did that, they looked up to the shore and they realized that the man was still there. So Dan said to Danny, like, obviously really quietly, like, don't move play dead. If we play dead, maybe this man 
will leave and we can just float along the river and see what happens. So that's what they did. They just laid there and pretended that they were dead. They waited and waited for what I can only imagine felt like forever, but finally the man did get into his truck and he drove away. From there, Dan and Danny just laid in the water, water that was so cold that it actually slowed down their bleeding and they floated along until finally they were saved. A man named Dean, who went by Pete, you remember Pete, him and his friend Gary and Don had been duck hunting and fishing in the area about a hundred yards down from where the shot happened. And this was just after 4.45 PM. He looked in the water and in the distance, he saw the two forms floating his way and he waited, not sure what he was seeing, but then once they got close enough, he could tell there were two people and he heard the voice calling out to him. So he walked into the water and grabbed Dan's hand, pulling the two to the shore. These men were later referred to as these kids angels because they saved their lives. You know, he went out into the water, they pulled them to shore, they called 911, they kept them warm until paramedics could arrive to save them. They really were for, you know, all intents and purposes, these kids angels. It's just so wild, dude, because this, this water in this river could have easily killed them. All the reports I read about this river said that it's like a wild one. And they were in there, shot in the head, unable to move, freezing, not able to swim, just floating along. And somehow, instead of killing them, it saved them, slowed down their bleeding and gave them an avenue to escape their kill, their attempted murder. It's just wild, man. Anyways, once pulled to the shore, as I said, Dan and Danny, bad shape, shaking violently. They can't talk. Dan's got blood coming out of his mouth and he's like choking on it. And Pete knows that like, they're probably not going to make it, but he does what he can regardless. The police are summoned and both of them are rushed to the hospital. That night, January 8th, police officers had to make phone calls to Dan and Danny's parents to let them know that their kids had been shot. Okay. So Danny's dad, his name was Brent. He lived in Harrisburg, which is about 35 minutes away from where his daughter was like in the hospital. And he gets this call, letting him know that his daughter was shot in the face. He grabbed his phone and he actually grabbed a photo of Danny that he took with him. And he held the entire drive from his home to the hospital. And all the while he was just talking to this picture. He had no idea if his daughter was going to make it, if he'd ever see her again. So he was just praying that she would be okay. He said when he first saw her in that condition that she was in, cause she was really, you know, she, she looked pretty messed up. He just had a serious feeling of helplessness because he was her father. It was his job to save her and protect her. And he couldn't do anything about it. And then on top of that, knowing what she went through, he just kept asking why, like, why would this happen to her? She was so innocent, but there were no answers. Police chief Albright promised Danny's parents that he would do everything in his power to catch the guy who did this to their daughter. And he was a father of two daughters that were close to Danny's age. So this hit him particularly hard. And if it wasn't just that, he had a lot of pressure from the community. They were angry. They were outraged. They were scared. And he knew he needed to catch whoever did this as quickly as possible. So many people were there for these kids. Danny's mom headed over, obviously her parents were there. Even her friend Elizabeth went over. And I guess Elizabeth was her like close friend and also her roommate in college. The two had met in freshman orientation. They bonded over the fact that they were both like super stoked about college. Like this was their Le passion and they got to be super duper close. They really hit it off. And so they really cared about each other. So when she heard what happened to her friend, she was terrified. She was terrified that Danny wasn't going to make it, but she was also terrified of how Danny would be if she did survive, because this is the type of thing that you never totally come back from. You're never the person you were prior to something like this happening to you. You are reborn, so to speak, as a new version. And she didn't know what that was going to look like. When she first got to the hospital, she heard the details of what happened to her friend from Danny's mother. And she was just like blown away. She was shocked. Like she was like, first off, who would do this? And her first thought was that Dan and Danny were not going to survive this because she had never heard of a person getting shot in the head and living to tell the tale. And like, that was what always blew my mind. Cause like, I know that you can, I've seen regarding Henry, but which is a movie, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's an older movie, but it still like blows my mind whenever I hear of somebody surviving something like that, because it seems like an unsurvivable thing. The two of them had such serious injuries, dude. Danny had been shot through her jaw. It was totally shattered. And the daughter, the daughter, the doctor who looked at it said that it was in so many pieces that it looked like Rice Krispies and her face had swollen to the size of a bowling ball. The shot had almost severed her tongue, dude. And Dan had been shot through the backside of his neck below his ear. And it went right through his windpipe and exited on the other side through his jaw. 
they were actually both shot through the jaw and they both needed reconstructive surgery and they both actually had several surgeries and as far as dan goes the shot also chipped one of his vertebrae and then the other one grazed his right ear it was just so brutal dude one of the detectives working the case this was detective doug he said that the brutality of this crime was beyond comprehension like who could do this how can you shoot two kids in the head and before that raping danny like what kind of monster could do something like this they were just really lucky to be alive even the da one of the da's i think there was is there more than one da anyway da paskey said that talking about what happened to these kids would send shivers down his spine like what they survived through and then he added quote i don't think you'll ever find two individuals with the courage and determination of these two young people so police go to the hospital to interview the kids, right? Because that's what you do. And when they get there, they find that Danny is actually in an induced coma. So she's not able to speak to them. But Dan, despite everything he went through, was actually awake. So Dan had all the injuries that I already described to you. But on top of that, doctors were really afraid that he was going to get a blood clot and that the blood clot would cut off oxygen to his brain. And he was in a ton of pain. And he was in so much pain that like every move he like would make would make the pain worse and on top of that he was on a ventilator so we couldn't actually speak but he was determined to help police catch whoever did this to them so they came up with like a system so he could speak to them they gave him a patent paper so he could write answers and they also he would like make a fist and he would move it up and down for yes and shake it like side to side for no so once they had all of that in place so that they knew they could talk to one another they started to question dan dan was able to tell police that the man who attacked them was white he was 35 to 40 years old. He was about 5'10". He was wearing a brown hat, blue jeans, and black shoes. Dan was able to tell police that the man was clearly drunk and that he even had a case of Natty Ice in his truck. He told police that the gun that he used to attack them was a black semi-automatic and was able to tell police that the man had a Rottweiler who was named Sam. Like, this is a lot of details on one person. He described the vehicle as a beat up red pickup truck with a white or gray cap and described items in the back of the truck like a toolbox and an aluminum baseball bat. So they had a lead to try to find this guy, but it was a very daunting task because there was a lot of ground to cover. They were going to have to search from where the crime took place to where they were pulled out of the river, right? Like all of that had to be searched. But first they had to find the crime scene. So officers went to the water's edge and they walked shoulder to shoulder all across the ground, looking down for any sign of something that took place. And finally they found a pool of blood. And then when they went closer to the water, they found the casings from a nine millimeter. So they knew this was where it happened from there. Detectives go and they speak to local police so that they could see if maybe they had an idea of who they were looking for. They told them all about it. They told them about the truck. They told them about the dog and quickly the officer, the local police officer tells the detectives like, I have, idea of somebody who you might want to look into it was a 40 year old man who was local to the area who had had lots of run-ins with police due to things like domestic violence alcohol things like that and this man owned a rottweiler this guy was bad news and he was known to be somebody who was violent but anytime he did anything violent to somebody they never pressed charges against him because he was always doing these things to his family members or people he was dating but he was known to police like officer tina the local lady told detectives that as soon as she heard that a vehicle matching the description of this guy's vehicle was in the area she knew it was him because she knew he was capable of great violence in hearing all of this the detectives want to see if maybe this is the guy who did this to the kids because when they're hearing all this they're like that sounds like a pretty good lead so from there they go and they create like a photo lineup you know they take a bunch of pictures including this guy's picture they put them all together and they take them to dan so that he can you know so they can see if anyone in the stack was somebody who might have done this to him you know you know how the lineup works so they go they start flipping down the photos for dan to see and as soon as this particular man's photo was laid down for dan he reacted very strongly like he couldn't speak but his eyes and his body language pure horror 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 one of dan's eyes was swollen shut but the other was open and as soon as he saw this photo his pupil dilated and he started hitting the photo over and over so just as a formality because you know they have to the officer looked at him and was like dan is this the guy who did it to you and dan signaled yes and he was like are you sure he got another yes so the cop looked at dan and was like i'm gonna go get him for you dan said of this moment like even though seeing him was very traumatizing and very scary for him he was also so glad to see his photo because that meant that they knew who it was and that he was going to be caught and that he couldn't do this again and that even if he would not admit that he was the person who did this dan knew danny would know 
and this man would pay for what he did to them. And this man, this monster we're talking about, is William Edward Babner. Now, I don't know a ton about William, but I will tell you what I do know. I know he was a high school dropout who lived in York Haven for a time and that he wasn't a good guy. In addition to what detectives Tina, Officer Tina had already said about him, his former landlord did speak out after he was arrested. And this was a man named Claire Donald Sawmiller. And Claire said that he and William had been good friends. They drive to work together at an excavating company. And he'd even sold William the truck that he used in the attack and two guns and let him rent a trailer that he owned. Like they were pretty close. Claire said that his friendship with William ended when like a couple of things happened. First off, he like screwed him on rent, which, you know, that's a pretty messed up thing to do when somebody lets you like live on their property. He also like destroyed the trailer. He like pissed all over the rugs and like ripped off like the wood paneling to use as kindling. He also said that William threatened him several times that he was always threatening to shoot him. And he said that William was always threatening to shoot people just in general. He was one of those people that was like, I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to shoot you. I've never met a person that's just doing that. But apparently William was always doing that. Claire also said that like William was an all right guy unless he was drinking, but said that he drank like every single day and then he would get radical and violent and want to fight people. And he said that he got to the point that he wouldn't go to the trailer that he owned any more than he had to because he was scared for his life. He ended up actually having to evict William because William would not leave. And it was successful. He did get him out and he did get a money judgment against him. But I'm going to guess that like William never paid that judgment because he sounds like a real asshole. But that aside, he was known to be violent, even though he had never been charged and like convicted of a violent crime, not charged, convicted of a violent crime because the people they committed the crimes against didn't want to press charges against him. Reports had been made, so there is a record of it. William allegedly used a chainsaw to cut up a bunch of his old girlfriend's items who was leaving him. He also allegedly attacked her van with an ax and he had restraining orders against him. He had guns, he had bows and arrows, he had knives, he had a chainsaw. He had, he was a violent guy with a lot of weapons. He'd also been in some trouble when, for whatever reason, he rammed his truck over and over into his own brother's car while he and his girlfriend, a woman named Barbara, were in the car. And luckily, he wasn't hurt. Or, no, excuse me. Not luckily, he wasn't hurt. Luckily, they weren't hurt. But apparently, as their car spun out, he yelled and laughed while they lost control. He was also said to have set his neighbor's shed on fire after the two got into a fight. So he had done a lot of things, but every time he would do something dangerous or unhinged, he would just have to pay a fine and that was it. So now a suspect has been identified and a manhunt is underway and they look everywhere for him. Anywhere they think he could be, places he frequented, associates, homes. They search and they search and they search, but they are unable to find him. So they call it a night they go home and almost immediately somebody actually spots his truck. So they have to go back out to go and arrest him. And they actually set up a SWAT team to go and make this arrest because they believe it's likely that this could be like a violent arrest. At about midnight, police head over to where his truck was parked. And it was actually parked at a home in York City. And this is where his girlfriend lived. And he was living with his girlfriend at the time, along with her two children. So SWAT set up about a house away. And then they just wait and they wait and they wait for hours. And their initial plan was to actually try to arrest William when he left for work that morning. But he never like left the house. Apparently, his boss ended up calling him when he just didn't show up. And he was like, Oh, yeah, I'm sick with the flu. I'll be back in on Monday. So now police know that they have to kind of change gears. After some time of waiting, William's girlfriend actually left the home. And as soon as she left the home, she was like, and he was she was like out of sight of the home. Police like swarmed her and they questioned her. And from talking to her, they were able to get an idea of who was in the house and what the schedule was for that day. She told police that at about 8pm, no, 8 a.m. Her five-year-old son was going to be leaving for school and like to get on the school bus and that William was going to be walking him to the bus to make sure he got on and got to school. Okay. So police decided that it would be better to arrest him when there wasn't a five-year-old in the house. So their plan was to let William take him, get him on the school bus. And as soon as the kid was out of harm's way, they were going to, you know, come down and arrest William. And that is what they did kinda, which we will get there. Cause that's a whole nother thing that I was like, what? But we'll get there. Once the boy was on the bus, the snipers told the men on the ground, like it is go time. So they go and they run to the house and at about 8 30 AM, they arrest him in his bathroom. He has no chance to do anything. Cause he had no idea they were coming and they were so fast. So he's taken into custody. And this is, I believe less than two days after Dan and Danny had been attempted to be killed. 
that's not the right way to say that, but you know what I'm trying to say. So there was some backlash over this arrest because when I tell you these police officers do be wild. And apparently what happened is this bus that was going to pick up this five-year-old boy that was filled with seven special needs children, might I add, was driven by a police officer. Apparently this bus driver, this woman had just been driving along when her bus was commandeered a la speed, if you've seen that movie. And the person was like, I'm going to be taking over. This person was a police officer. was like, I'm going to be taking over. You lay on the ground so that nobody can see you. I'm going to drive this bus and go pick up this kid. Because they figured that if, you know, the bus like didn't show up on time or if the bus showed up empty, like with no kids in it, William might figure that something was up and things could get worse. But like they also switched the usual driver, which was a woman to this random dude and then parked in a weird spot. So they were already doing weird shit. Um, but sure, they said that they, you know, parked the bus out of the line of fire. So, you know, nobody needed to worry about their kids, to which I say, um, fuck off. But it's just so crazy to me. I guess after they picked up the boy, they drove down a little bit and then the officer was like, okay, I'm going to go now. You go ahead and just finish your route. And the cop jumped off and she got back in the driver's seat and she like drove. Can you imagine being her? I guess she was super shooken up by the whole situation because she didn't know this was going to happen. This wasn't planned. Police said that they did this because they were worried that William was going to freak out and take the boy hostage. So in order to stop that, they kind of put all of these kids in danger because what if something had gone wrong? They would have been right next to a violent man with a gun. And when I tell you that parents were pissed bro which i would have been too i would have been so fucking pissed i'm gonna say it now i would have lost my mind and the school was mad too because again this wasn't planned these officers just randomly willy-nilly commandeered this bus now police did come out later and said that like they were proud of their work they said that generally operations like this that were working with so many jurisdictions don't typically go off without a hitch, but this did. And they were able to arrest a very dangerous man super quickly. And that was good police work. They then said that like ideally taking the kids off of the bus would have been the safest route to go, but that that wasn't an option. The time wasn't there. So basically people should just be happy that everything went well. That was their response. And I read that and I was like, you guys are wild. <laughs> like my, no, 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 no. I will say as a parent now, I would be super pissed just because like, okay, I know you have to catch the super violent man. Like I want this man caught, but could they not just let him come? Normal bus situation, normal bus driver, they're watching, let him come, put the kid on the bus, let him walk back into the house and arrest him there. Could they not just do that? Considering that's what they ended up doing anyway and didn't need to involve any kids at all. Let me know your thoughts on this. Would you be super pissed if this was your kid? Cause this blew my mind. But anyways, he's arrested. And once officers were inside his home, they found so much evidence against him. They found all the things he had been wearing that night and they found the gun and they even found Sam the pup. And everything was just like Dan said it would be down to what was in the bed of the truck and the studded collar that Sam was wearing. And if that hadn't been enough, both Dan and Danny's blood were on his clothes. So his goose effectively cooked. After William was arrested, police knew that they were going to have some issues because their case would clearly be stronger and strongest if Dan and Danny could testify. But at this point, they were still in such bad shape that people weren't sure what the outcome was going to be with them. They weren't sure if they were going to make it. Speaking of Dan and Danny, let's go back to them. So as I said, Danny was in a coma and she was in this medically induced coma for five days. And while she was in this coma, she underwent surgery. Her tongue had been shot and nearly severed. So it was repaired and a plate was put into her jaw and her jaw was wired shut. So once Danny woke up in the hospital, she had a lot going on. She had a tube sticking out of her stomach and a tracheotomy and was clearly suffering and in a lot of pain, but the meds made her hallucinate. And considering what had just happened to her, the hallucinations she was having, the visions, the, the, the imagery, if you will, was not kind. It wasn't something you wanted to be seeing. She saw bloody people, the floating bodies of kids and people hanging. And every time she saw something new, she would, she would write down everything that she saw. Her family was there when she would have these freakouts, they would like comfort her, but they really couldn't help her much because one, they didn't know what she was going through. And two, every time she looked at her, her own mother, she would see blood like running down her mom's face. 
she couldn't sleep because her dreams were so horrifying. So she would force herself to stay awake, but she was lucky because she didn't have to go through all of this by herself. She had her mother, Cindy there, her stepdad, George, and her father, Brent, were all there taking shifts to sit there so she wouldn't have to be alone with everything she was going through. On top of going through it mentally, she was also going through it physically. The first time she looked at herself in the mirror, she like saw herself from the chest up, she started to cry. She hate she hated what she saw. She hated the feeling of the wire in her jaw and the dirt between her teeth. And on top of that, she woke up thinking that Dan was dead. She was convinced that he had not made it. Despite her seeing him pulled from the river too, she was convinced that he did not make it. Even when she, her family told her, she would ask him like, where's Dan? And they were like, he's fine. He's just down the hall. She did not believe them. She was so convinced that he was gone that her family had to go to him. They're like, hey, could you like write her a note. So he did. He wrote her a note that just said like, Danny, I love you. I'm okay. And that's when she finally like believed that he had made it. Can you even imagine how hard all of that would be mentally? Cause I truly cannot. Six months after the attempted murder, the trial began. And even though there was so much evidence against William, when the charges were read out, he shook his head. No, like he was appalled that these things were being said about him and he pled not guilty, but he was held. He was given bond, but he was given a million dollar bond, $500,000 for each of his victims. I don't know what he thought. You know, I don't sometimes when there's this much evidence, I'm always wondering like, what are these people thinking? Because they had so much against him. They had, um, one of the victims actually pointing him out. You know what I mean? Like recognizing him in a photo lineup. They had their blood, Dan and Danny's blood on his clothing. They had his tire tracks, right? The tire tracks that were at the scene, they matched him to the tires on his truck. And even some of Sam's dog hair was matched to dog hair that was on Dan's coat. But anyways, he pled guilty. So they would have to go to trial. This would be totally re-traumatizing for Dan and Danny. They were so scared to have to do this, to have to go and be confronted by him, to be just feet away from him, they were filled with terror and anxiety. And the prosecutor thinks that William only did this, only pled not guilty and made them go through a trial so that he could make them relive everything he put them through publicly again, because William didn't even testify at his own trial. When Dan and Danny testified, the whole courtroom was totally silent. Danny broke down as she saw evidence, her clothes caked in mud that were literally cut from her body and the gun, it was incredibly difficult for her. She knew that during her testimony, all the details that she was going to be giving, especially when it came to the rape, were going to be given to a courtroom full of people, which included her family. And this meant that these people were gonna know exactly what she had gone through. They were gonna know details that she was not ready to share with people yet, but she had to. And despite the fact that she was going through hell, she did really well. She was on the stand for, I believe, 30 minutes total, and she made it through 25 minutes before she finally broke down and started to cry. She told the court through tears, like, I am 19 years old. I am not supposed to go through something like this. Dan testified over the phone, actually from college. He, I don't believe he was ever, I think he might've been there for the sentencing, but I don't think he was there for the actual trial, but he testified over the phone and he said that he finds it impossible to talk to strangers and he has a harder and harder time even caring about other people. It's like, this man destroyed his empathy. And then he went on to tell the court his, you know, recollection of what happened to them because he had sort of a different point of view, a different vantage point than Danny did. He told the court his whole memory of the event from the moment they were abducted to the moment they were shot. He said he remembered begging William to let them go and offering him anything and everything that they had. And that the man just told him to shut up. He said he remembered laying there listening to the girl he cared about being raped and not being able to do anything about it. And he said he knew when they were being led from that truck to the river that they were going to be shot and that they were going to die. Like he didn't have any of that hope that they were now going to be let go like Danny did. He was asked like, did you ever try to escape? Like, why didn't you ever try to run? And he said that he never tried to run because he was worried if he did that this man was going to kill Danny. He said that when he was shot, he just felt a tremendous force that knocked him to the ground. And he said that he just laid there looking at the dirt and watching his blood fall from his own mouth. And that he just felt very cold and very tired, very fast. He said when Danny kneeled down beside him, he just told her like, I'm sorry, but I have to go now. And the next thing he remembered, he felt his body being turned over and over and blood patterns showed that this was actually William kicking him into the water after he was shot. 
He said after feeling that turning over and over thing, he felt the shocking cold of like the swirling cold water that he was dumped into. And it kind of like made him wake up. And that's when he looked over and he saw Danny in the water as well. Danny has repeatedly said that Dan was her hero and her savior in the situation. There was even a point where they were in the water together and their hands separated and Dan used all his strength to swim back to her, grab her and start pulling her towards shore. Like he did everything for her. He was conscious and aware and thinking and trying and saving. And even the DA said that Dan had helped solve this case because if William had been successful in what he had intended to do, which was kill them, he probably would have gotten away with it because there wasn't a connection between the murderer and his victims. You know what I mean? Like if he had been successful, he would have killed them and there was no connection between them. So it would have been super hard to solve. Dan has said he does not consider himself a hero. It's not a thing that he thinks about himself. And he seemed a little bit like, like he found it weird when people would say it, but he did also say that he was glad he was there and he would do it a thousand times over if it meant he was saving Danny. Now, as for William, I guess his attorneys did the best that they could with what they had. Like they really didn't have a lot to work with. They basically just tried to prove that intent wasn't there, that William didn't intend to do what he did and that he didn't even have a memory of doing it. Cause I guess he was pretty like smashed. He had like Xanax, Ritalin, Prozac, and enough alcohol to render a human comatose in his system, which made it so he could not even remember what he had done. When Danny heard like that this was going to be the route that they were doing, she was just kind of like too bad. So sad just because he doesn't remember doing it doesn't mean that he gets away with doing it. He still needs to pay for what he did. And then she said, quote, what right did he have to put our lives in his hands? So after about a week of trial in August of 2000, the jury was sent to do their thing. And after only about an hour of deliberation, they came back. Dan and Danny were holding each other when they found that William had been found guilty. He was found guilty of two counts of attempted murder, two counts of kidnapping, one count of robbery because he took 40 or $45 from Dan, three counts of involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, and one count of rape. And then he was also charged with carrying a firearm without a license, but that was like the least of the things he had done wrong. More than a dozen friends and families, like friends and families, friends and family members swarmed Dan and Danny and just hugged them and were their support and held them up. Like they were really overwhelmed with emotion. Like they felt a huge sense of relief, but it was also just like, you know, I can't imagine being in that position, but it feels like a wave, right? Of just like, what is going on? But he had been found guilty. And now all that was left was the sentencing. And speaking of the sentencing, Dan said of this, and I quote, although I feel a lot of anger towards this man, I'm not excited about sending him away to jail for the rest of his life. I'm just glad it's over. Which honestly is like so big of this teenage boy. You know what I mean? Like that is big of you to not want to send this guy who did this to you to jail for the rest of his life because I want this guy to be in jail for the rest of his life. And he didn't do anything to me <laughs> before handing down his sentence. The judge, you know, reviewed William's prior criminal history, you know, weighing the mitigating and aggravating factors against each other to see what he should be sentenced with. They noted that he had a conviction for drunk driving, dealing weed, welfare fraud. They also noted that he had a quote, thin employment record and has persistent problems with drugs and alcohol. And that in combination with all of the things that were on his record that I already told you about made the judge come to the determination that this man needed to be locked away for a long, long time. For his crimes, he was facing 20 to 40 years for each of his counts of attempted murder, and then 10 to 20 years for the other crimes. Ultimately, William was given 117 and a half to 235 years in prison. He will literally be 150 years old before he's even eligible for parole. And all of his sentences are to be ran consecutively, not concurrently. The prosecutor was like, listen, this man is the face of evil. And the next time he's going to leave jail is in a box and he deserves every single one of those years he was given. To which I'm like, damn, I've covered two survivor stories recently. And in both cases, these men got so much jail time. And to that, I just want to slow clap because I feel like we've covered cases before where they get such minimal. Sorry about that. Where they get such minimal jail time because their victims were strong enough to survive. And it's like your intent was there, my guy. You should be punished for that. Let me know what you think about that. Should their sentences be this harsh when it comes to attempted murder? Because I feel like we're all on the same page, but I don't know if maybe if you have an opposing view what that is, let me know. Anyways, I got off on a thing there, but the judge said to William, quote, Mr. Babner, the acts you committed on Danielle Keener and Daniel Zapp 
or ruthless, senseless, heartless acts of violence. You have forever destroyed their youth, emotional well-being, trust, and innocence. How do they sleep at night? How will they ever erase your face from their minds? William, who showed no emotion at all during the trial, just kneeled on a chair in his shackles waiting to be led back to prison. And the DA said that this was the first step in putting a very dangerous monster behind bars for a long time. When William was asked if he had anything he wanted to say, he simply handed his attorney a piece of paper. And when the attorney read it, it said that uh, he had ineffective counsel, his attorney was fired, and he immediately planned to appeal. What a dick, right? Like, I mean, we know he's a dick, but he's just like one of those guys. Like, for example, when he was in jail, he like gave an interview or something. I can't remember who he was talking to, but he said that like he didn't remember doing what he did, but that he was starting to get some memories back of it. And if he had done what they were saying he did, and he was starting to believe that he did, that he should get life in prison because what he did was a terrible thing. But then he's like, I'm going to go ahead and appeal. So he's just an asshole and a liar. Anyways, Dan and Danny did try to stay in contact and communicate with each other. After all was said and done, they would always talk to each other on the anniversary of them being rescued. And they even at one point went to the river's edge where they had been, you know, where everything had happened. Um, and they did this the year that William was convicted. But their relationship was just never the same as it had been before that. Every time they talked to each other, it was just like bringing up the past over and over and over again. And Dan said that when he would talk to her, he would just feel bad. He would think about all the ways he failed and all the ways that he couldn't save her. And it got to the point that he dreaded those conversations. So they just kind of drifted apart while they took their separate time to heal. Transitioning back to school was really hard for Danielle. She had a lot of trouble feeling safe and trusting people, as I'm sure you can imagine. She was really withdrawn, particularly when it came to men that she didn't know. And she was just like really scared. She had trouble. She couldn't walk alone at night. She had nightmares that kept her up. And it was really upsetting for those who knew her because they could see her suffering and in so much pain and so scared and they wanted to help her, but there was nothing that they could do to help her. Danielle knew that she had like a lot of inner work that she had to do herself so that she could heal. And she did do this because four months after the conviction at the school, they had this thing called the Take Back the Night on campus, which was a rally against rape where people could go and speak about their experiences and use their voices. Danny went to one of these nights and after several people had spoken, there was a break where nobody had talked and Danny, who had been just like sitting and listening and she was in awe of the bravery of these women, she got up, right? And she walked to the podium to tell her story. She said that when she told her whole story, she felt a lot of power and strength that she thought this man had stolen from her come back to her. And it was in this moment that she realized that even though he had taken so much from her, there was so much that he had not taken, that he hadn't touched, and that he had no effect on. Every year, Danny returned from her home in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia area rather, to York County Victims' Rights Coalition's March and Candlelight Vigil. People gather who have suffered from a crime, and the first time she went, she knew it was exactly what she needed to do. She returns because the vigil to her represents her survival, her strength, and her hope. And this always brings out really big crowds. In 2009, more than 200 people were present for the 23rd annual March and Vigil. There are always many victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, child abuse, and family members of murder victims, along with victims of crimes themselves. They all go and they get together so that they can be each other's strength. Danny has said that she's moved on in a way. However, one does move on from something like that. She says she doesn't let what happened to her define her, and she knows that what happened is part of her history, but it is not who she is. Now, as for Dan, Dan said that it took him a bit longer to deal with what happened to him, to really sit back, look at the situation, open up about it, talk about it, get therapy. He feels like it took longer than it should have for him to help himself. He didn't want to confront it. He wanted to just try to ignore it, push it to the side and hope that one day it would go away on its own, but that just wasn't working. But it really like, he went through a lot emotionally, even in court. He said that this ruined his life and like shattered his emotions. Cause remember he said he was having trouble, like even caring about people. So he had a lot of work that he had to do. He says that now though, things are better, that he has taken the time to grow and to heal and to change. And you can see that in later interviews, you can see that he seems a lot better. And him and Danny have actually gone on to, you know, restart their friendship. They're super, super close. They're really, you know, they have, you know, a shared bond over something horrible and they've been able to rekindle that friendship. It's not a romance. It's not that kind of happy ending. They're both actually married, but they're able to be friends without re-traumatizing each other. Danny says that her and Dan are connected by their souls and that they will always be an important part of each other's lives. 
Oh, and speaking of the fact that they're married, one thing that's super duper cute is at Danny's wedding, the police chief, like some of the officers who worked on her case, and also Pete, do you remember Pete the duck hunter? They were all guests at Danny's wedding. And she's gone on to have a daughter, which is just, you know, so I'm just happy that she's happy. You know what I mean? I'm just happy that they're both okay and alive and dealing and found love and it seems so hard. It seems like it would be so easy to just like stop existing after something like that happens. And I'm glad that they didn't is basically what I'm trying to say. Now for a sort of where are they now ish section, there aren't any um, like super recent articles, but I'll tell you like the latest thing that I was able to find. Danny earned her master's degree in social services and went on to be a group counselor for those suffering from addiction and mental illnesses. And she lives in Philadelphia. And Dan went on to earn a degree in psychology and worked for a research company living somewhere in Maryland. So that's kind of where they are. I don't know what's going on with them now. I didn't try to look them up like online, like on social media or anything, because I just want to let them like have their peace and do their thing and not like get all up in their business. But isn't that just such a crazy case? When I read about this, I was just like, so affected by what happened to them. And I was not alone in feeling that. What happened to them really affected people. Like for example, one of the officers who worked on their case won an award, I believe the year after, it was the 2000 Law Enforcement Officer of the Year Award. And this was given to him by the Police Heritage Museum, which I had no idea was a thing, but I guess he was chosen by his peers. And when given this award, he actually dedicated it to Dan and Danny. And this was the officer I talked about before, who had two teenage daughters who were like Danny's age and was super invested in this case. When he got his award, he dedicated it to Dan and Danny. Man, it's just so wild that this even happened. Like when I think about it, it's just so many things that had to come together. Wrong place, wrong time, you know? Like William didn't even live right there. He lived in York, but he was there visiting his girlfriend's brother and just knew that the boat launch was like a good place to let his dog run and splash. And then as far as Dan goes, he was from Bethlehem, which was like two hours away. And he just happened to be here to see Danny. It's just like so many of these little pieces had to fit together for something so horrible to happen. And then so many other pieces had to fit together for them to survive. Now I want to end this video with a quote from Dan, because I feel like this perfectly rounds up this, this video, it perfectly rounds up the story. It gives his perspective, both the positive and the negative. Dan said, quote, I'm a little more paranoid around strangers and I'm a little more wary of going places on my own, but I also believe I was given a gift, a second chance, and that there's a reason why I'm still here. He added, you learn to do a lot with your life because it can be short. You learn to appreciate the people you love because they can be taken away very quickly. And then Dan said that he's glad that it's over, but it'll never be closed. Gather around and let me tell you the survival story of Thaddeus Phillips, the 13 year old boy who spent 43 hours with the bone breaker killer. 43 hours of torture. That is what was inflicted on 13 year old Thaddeus Phillips in Baraboo, Wisconsin. On July 29th, 1995, just after 1.30 AM, after having a really nice night out with his whole family. It was his parents and his three siblings. They had gone out to dinner together. Thaddeus Phillips, who went by Thad, his family called him Thad, had been sleeping on the couch when he, he had fallen asleep on the couch with his little sister. When he woke up to something strange, what do you think woke him up? He's all groggy. He's 13. He's barely waking up. And he wakes up to the sensation, the feeling of being carried. This is so crazy to me because he's just sleeping on the couch and he's sleeping next to his little sister, a smaller child, mind you, like a little girl. Um, but still it's Thad who gets taken and Thad, you know, feels like he's being carried, but in his sleepy child brain, he thinks that it's his dad carrying him to bed because typically if he'd fall asleep on the couch, his dad would scoop him up and take him to bed. So he just kind of falls back asleep in this person's arms, assuming that he's going to be safely tucked into bed, but he was very wrong. He was actually being carried out of his house by a 17 year old kid named Joseph Clark, a kid who had already gotten away with murdering one other teenage boy a year prior. Joseph Clark was born in 1977 in Wisconsin and was born to a mother who ended up giving him up for adoption, where he ended up being placed into a family that didn't have a ton of money with parents who had a pretty serious drinking problem. He described his childhood as happy overall, not much to complain about despite these issues. He said that though his parents were functionally functioning alcoholics, he was still cared for and anything he wanted or needed that his family could afford, they would get for him. Joseph did, however, say that he was going to bars, to pubs, 
with his parents by the time he was 11 or 12, which I would like to know. Who is carting the door at this bar? Because I don't think that's allowed. But either way, he would go to the bar with his parents while they would get drunk. And he would hustle adults at pool for money. So he'd pretend he couldn't play. And then they'd try to play him. And then he'd, he'd like whip them and take their money. In school, Joseph Clark was said to have been a bit of a bully. There were different instances that they have on record of him bullying other kids, but he says that this was just taken out of context and blown into something that it wasn't, that he did have these altercations with these kids, but that it wasn't him bullying them. It was him and his friends messing around, you know, deflecting completely. But this is the same kid who, while he was in school, called one of his teachers and threatened to murder his teacher. But again, this was taken out of context and over-exaggerated as well, because what really happened is he was just prank calling his teacher and things got out of hand and then he threatened to murder him. Totally normal behavior. So that's already like not great, right? Well, one more thing happened in Joseph Clark's background as a child that we generally see, not always, but it is common to be seen with future serial killers. And I'm going to give you some options so you can guess which one you think it was. A. Sexual abuse as a child. B. The tendency to torture animals. Or C. A traumatic head injury. I'm going to give you a second here to type down your, your guess down below, A, B, or C. If you guessed C, a traumatic head injury, you are correct because when Joseph Clark was 15 years old he got into a bad accident while riding a dirt bike that left him with a broken collarbone blown a broken collarbone a brain bleed and a subdermal hematoma apparently Joseph and a friend of his had been working together um, and they like worked outside and it started to rain so they had gone home to just kind of hang out and once the rain stopped they're like let's go on a dirt bike ride the two of us just the two of us, you and I. So his friend was driving the dirt bike and he was hit sitting on the handlebars. They got into an accident that threw him pretty far. And it, obviously it was bad enough that he required hospitalization. It was like a whole thing. And from then on, he was not the same. And he, that was when he was 15. And by the next year, he was already acting on his desire to hurt people, people smaller and weaker than he was. And this was the person who was carrying 13 year old dad out of his house that night. And him and his family had no idea what he was in for. Um, oh my God. I can't even imagine how his parents were feeling when they found out that he wasn't there and then how they felt when they found out what happened to him. It must've been so traumatizing, but I couldn't really find anything on his parents or what was happening during the time he was missing. Um, all I found is that his father discovered that he wasn't in the house at 4 a.m. Uh, so he was taken at 1 30 at 4 a.m. He discovered that he wasn't there and that they were completely confused because they looked around and it didn't look like anything had happened. There was no sign of a struggle or anything like that because he carried him out asleep. Um, but they were insistent that Thad would not have left on his own. So they didn't understand what had happened. The next time that Thad regained consciousness was when Joseph Clark set him like on the ground on the side of the road. And it's probably because this child was a lot heavier than he anticipated and the walk of like he was carrying him down the street with like on foot <laughs> and he probably wasn't intending on this kid being as heavy as he was and this walk being as um, labor intensive as it was so he sets him on the ground and dad wakes up and he's really out of it it's like 1 30 in the morning it's super he's super groggy he's a child and in his groggy sleepy state he thinks that well, one, he doesn't know where he is right he's only lived in this area him and his family had literally only moved in two weeks prior. Nightmares, nightmare fuel. This is like the worst thing. I can't even imagine. But anyway, Charlie, did you take my brain cells again? I think so. I think you did. Anyways, Thad wakes up. He's super confused. And he in his sleepy state thinks that Joseph Clark is like a family friend. He doesn't say he recognizes him, but you know, when you're out of it, like things don't make any sense. So he thinks it's a family friend. And he asks him like if they're having car trouble, cause he must've been like half in and half out of sleep. Like I can only imagine. And Joseph was like, actually, yes, it's exactly what's happening. Uh, we are having car trouble. My car is just over that hill that way. So you need to come with me and we need to go so we can fix this problem. That's like, cool. Sounds great. Let's, let's get on that. So the duo starts running down the road together. Um, towards this 
fictitious car. And with each step that that runs, and each stretch of road that the two go down where they do not approach a car, 13 year old Thad starts to realize that something is not quite right here. And as he and Joseph Clark get to their secondary location, I guess this would be the first location because he didn't really take them two places. Secondary locations are not good places. But anyway, once he gets to Joseph Clark's house with Joseph Clark and he sees the, the house that's in real bad shape, real broken down, the yards covered in trash and debris, Thad realizes that he is in danger and he is at the house of a stranger. At this point, he's freaking out, right? He's looking around the yard. He sees that it's covered in trash and it's covered in trees. And I can only imagine that he's starting to freak out and that Joseph Clark is realizing that Thad's starting to freak out. So he does what he can to calm him down. And he's like, hey, 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 don't, don't worry, guy. Um, you're here for a party. Uh, we're going to have a big party. There's no big deal. All your friends are going to be there. And he starts rattling off the names of teenage boys that lived in the area, teenage boys who went to school with Thad, and names of boys that he recognized. And upon hearing this, Thad's like, oh, well, clearly there is a party. Like, he couldn't pull these names out of nowhere, so this must be legit. There must not be something wrong. I'm overreacting. And then he enters the home with Joseph Clark, and he looks around, and he sees that the house is in just awful condition. There's trash everywhere. There's old food everywhere. Like the whole place is a pigsty. Not exactly the type of place you would expect to have a party with a bunch of teenage boys. So once inside, the two boys were totally alone. Now, where was this boy's parents? Where were his siblings? I have no idea, but they were totally alone. And Joseph was like, you know what? Do you, do you like model cars? Because I totally have some model cars upstairs in my room. And Thad being 13 was like, Oh heck yeah, that sounds great. Let's go look at these model cars. So they climb the stairs to go to Joseph Clark's bedroom. Once in there, uh, he does have model cars. So Thad sits, you know, on the floor or whatever, and he starts playing with the model cars because he's a child. And Joseph Clark sits there and watches him and waits for the perfect moment to attack. And once Thad's guards down, he's playing with the cars. He has his right moment. Joseph Clark grabs 13 year old Thad and throws him on his bed and jumps on top of him. And before Thad can do anything to defend himself, to try to fight him off at all, Joseph Clark grabs Thad by the ankle and twists his foot around until he hears the bones inside snap. Yeah, I told you. His name is the Bone Breaker Killer. He breaks the bones of his victims. That's what he does. No, 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 no. So once this was done, once Joseph had gotten off of Thad and was distracted, he was just sitting on the edge of his bed, like holding his head in his hands. Thad, apparently not, not feeling the pain of what just happened to him, more feeling the adrenaline of knowing he needs to get out, just go and just go. He gets up and he tries to make a run for it. And oh my God, this is, uh, uh, uh. he says that when he went to run, he could feel his broken bones like grinding against each other. And he could feel that when he tried to step his leg, like his ankle bone slid right past his foot bone because they were no longer connected. And that little bit of information um, ruined my life, but not as much as it ruined his life, I'm sure. So he goes and runs for it and he makes it all the way down the flight of stairs before Joseph Clark catches up to him, grabs him from behind and puts him in a chokehold and rips him towards the living room. He pulled him backwards away from an exit away from freedom. And he pulled him to his couch where he got him on the couch and he got him positioned in such a way that he was able to get Thad's leg up on his knee. And he started to push upward so that his leg went above like Thad's own leg went above his head and he pushed and he pushed until Thad's femur snapped. Okay. That's the thick thigh bone. The thigh bone snapped. Can you even imagine the type of pain that you would be in? How bad that would hurt the sound? Oh, like all of it just messes me up. I don't, I've never broken a bone. And the thought of this like destroys me. But Thad said that for whatever reason, he didn't feel any of the pain at first when this was happening to him. It was just all adrenaline and he didn't feel the pain of having his femur literally just, just broke, just snapped right there on the couch. Ugh. He just said that he heard a pop, the pop of his bone breaking, and that was it. No pain. But this kid, knowing that he was trapped, I mean, he, how, how are you going to run? 
on a, on a broken ankle and a broken femur. You're not. So he knew he had the presence of mind to know that he needed to start talking to his abductor, talking to his torturer, humanizing himself with him and trying to make a connection to save his life. How he knew to do this at 13 years old, I have no idea, but he did. He started talking to Joseph. He started trying to get to know Joseph. It started trying to get Joseph to get to know him. He asked him like, what's your name? And Joseph answered, honestly, he didn't give him his full name, but he said like, my name's Joe. And he went on to tell him about his life a little bit. Joseph told him like that he lived alone in this house with his brothers. That part wasn't actually true. His mother lived there, but she was away babysitting her grandchildren in like another area. He talked to Thad about his life, about his friends, about his girlfriend, about his car. Like they just like bonded like friends, which is super weird. And he would do that uh, throughout the hours of this ordeal. He would like be his friend and then torture him, be his friend and torture him. It was, a, it was mind torture as well as what he was into. And then Thad decided to ask like, a pretty basic question, something that was probably ever present on his mind. And he was like, why, why'd you break my leg? My guy, like, why did you decide that that was what you wanted to do today? Why did you uh, do this to me? And Joseph Clark responds with something that I'm sure just like chilled, chilled Thad from the inside out. And he said that he just liked and was fascinated by the sounds of bones snapping which is like one of the worst answers I imagine that you want to get when asking that question in his current position. So Thad then went on to ask Joe like, okay, that's a weird, it's a weird thing to be into, but sure. Why don't you just try to break your own bones? And Joseph Clark, who had apparently previously tried this was like, oh man, you know, I've tried, but I can never get the angles quite right. So then Thad goes on to be like, oh, okay. So have you ever done this before with like another another person like, or am I your first? And he then admitted that no, that you were not my first. I have already done this to two boys. I tortured and murdered two boys before you. And that was just like, <sighs> of course you did. Like, I can only imagine how horrifying of an answer that was to learn that there were two boys prior to you in the position you're in and that both of them are dead. And you're just laying there like tight. Thad was then kept in Joseph's house as a prisoner for hours. By the end of it, it was 43 hours total. And all the while Thad begged and pleaded for his release, but Joseph Clark was just not having it. Uh, Thad and he would go back and forth between being really friendly. Like Joseph would act like his good friend. The two would go downstairs and watch TV together. And then he would snap and turn into a monster and start torturing him again. And Thad just did everything he could think of. He was like, I won't tell anybody. Just let me go. I will say that I tripped and I fell over a table and snapped my own leg. Like, don't worry, I will never turn you in. And Joe Clark was just kind of like, no one would ever believe that and wouldn't let him go. And at one point he, poor Thad, had thought that he was going to get saved because, you know, during one of the moments where Joseph Clark was being nice to him, he was like, oh, you know, can I please call my parents? And Joe was like, absolutely, my guy, of course you can. We are bros. And he gave him a phone so that he could try to call his parents. And when Thad went to do so, he found that the phone wasn't even connected, like the phone line wasn't working. And he was like, great. And it turned out that this was just like a giant joke to Joseph Clark and he was just tormenting him. In another one of these instances where Joseph was acting cool, acting like he was Thad's BFFFFFF, the two had been sitting downstairs in the living room watching TV together. And what I can only imagine would be incredibly awkward and tense silence. Joseph decided that he wanted to mess around with his prey a little bit more. So he scooped Thad up and walked back upstairs to his bedroom where he put him down on the bed again. He then climbed on top of him and grabbed his other ankle, the one that wasn't broken yet. I believe this was his left ankle. And he started to twist. He twisted and he twisted until the bone broke. And then he twisted some more until Thad's foot was turned completely around. Thad said of this that he never screamed. He never cried. He, he probably screamed, but that he never cried. And he never let on to Joe how hurt or scared he was because he didn't want to give him the satisfaction. 
I watched um, an interview with Thad, and Thad described this act as Joe just twisting and twisting, and that he twisted his leg until his skin looked like a twisted rubber band and his feet were backwards. When Joseph would do these things, Thad would fight and he would scream, and Joseph would take a pillow and press it down on Thad's face or make Thad hold it on his own face to muffle the sounds of his screaming. And he told Thad, like, if you don't stop screaming, I'm going to either snap your neck or break your back. And at this point, like, <laughs> of course, Thad believes that he's going to do this. Look what he's already done to him. You know what I mean? So he would do his best to try to keep himself from screaming, but he would also do his best to try to fight Joseph off. Like when Joseph would do this, he would be sitting on him, but facing away from him. So Joseph, no. So Thad would start punching Joseph like in the back and in the back of the head, but it didn't do anything to stop him or slow him down. It just pissed him off. So once this deed was done, the deed of twisting his other foot around like a rubber band, he took Thad's foot and he turned it back the right way. And he then proceeded to wrap both of Thad's broken angle, ankles, <laughs> ankles, and his broken thigh bone with ace bandages to try to hold them straight. And then placed these like new white socks over his legs to try to conceal what he had done. After this, he proceeded to actually hook Thad up with a pair of leg braces. He had these on deck, like a pair of leg braces, and then would just leave Thad in his room where he would periodically go downstairs, leave the house, go outside to try to work on his car. Periodically throughout the day, he would come back upstairs to torture Thad further. He would make him stand up and make him try to walk on these leg braces with his broken legs. And at one point he like led him to the edge of the staircase and then just pushed him down the stairs where he landed on his back. He would just go through these periods where he would just come up and continuously terrorize this child. Finally, the Saturday after Thad had been abducted, he had his first moment where he thought he was going to actually have a chance to escape. This was his first chance to do so. And as I said, he had been laying upstairs in Joseph's bedroom and he would hear Joseph periodically go downstairs, go outside to try to work on his car and try to get his car to start. But thus far it had been unsuccessful. His car just wasn't working until it was. And what happened was is Thad is laying upstairs and he hears, you know, Joe downstairs. He hears the front door open. He hears him go outside. He hears a car like ignition turning. He hears it start up and then he hears the car drive away. And I can only imagine at this point what was going through Thad's head. Uh, I, I, I just can't, I, I just can't imagine. Like he must've been thinking like, is this real? Is my mind playing tricks on me? Is Joseph playing a trick on me to see what I do? If I try to leave, am I going to be killed? Like all of these thoughts must've been swirling through this young kid's head, but he gathered his nerve and he decided that he had to at least go for it. So he pulled himself out of Joseph's bed and he then started to pull himself across the floor to get to the staircase. And he said that as he would do this, he would periodically lose consciousness due to the pain. And finally he made it out of the room into the staircase where he threw himself head first down the flight of stairs because there was no other way he was going to get down. And he did this um, fully prepared to accept whatever waited for him at the bottom. By the time Thad reached the bottom of the stairs, he had passed out again. And when he woke up, he found that Joseph had returned. And he had actually returned with a girlfriend who had been in the home while Thad lay there broken and bleeding just feet away from her, but she never saw him. In the time it took him to get himself downstairs and to pass out, Joe had returned, spent some time with his guests, and the guests had left. And now he was pissed to see Thad at the bottom of these stairs. Joseph scooped Thad up and took him back upstairs to his room where he proceeded to punish him. And to punish him, he took off the the leg braces, he took off the socks, he took off the bandages, and he proceeded to twist both of Thad's already broken ankles back and forth to cause him more pain. He then started to jump up and down on this boy's broken legs and on his chest while he just laid there having to accept this. This poor kid said that his legs at this point were just like completely destroyed, that his thigh was swollen to the size of a basketball and his ankles were swollen to the size of softballs. Once Joseph was satisfied that his punishment had been enough, he then went on to then tend to Thad's wounds again. He wrapped them up in ace bandages and placed these nice white socks back over his legs. And Thad has said that this felt ritualistic to him, that when 
Joseph would put these socks on his legs. He would place them on very carefully and he'd make sure they were just right, lining up the seams perfectly so that they just looked pristine. And he said that Joseph had hundreds of pairs of these brand new white socks at his disposal, which does seem super weird. And he said that he had gotten to this point that where he knew that Joseph putting these socks on his legs was a sign that the torture was done for a little while. At any time he would take the time to wrap him up and put him in these socks, this was his way of knowing that Joseph was going to take a substantial break between now and the next time he would torture him. The following day was Thad's little brother's birthday and Thad woke up in a stranger's home with legs that were broken and bruised. He said that they were yellow and they were swollen and that they didn't even look like they belonged to a human being and that the pain that he was feeling was completely indescribable. And that same day in a moment of frustration, Joseph came upstairs and he proceeded to again, jump up and down on this child's broken bruised legs, um, jumping up and then slamming down as hard as he could repeatedly with his kneecaps. And he, in doing this, slammed down so hard on Thad's kneecap, on Thad's kneecap with his kneecap, that he broke Thad's kneecap and pushed it completely around the other side of his leg. Now, I don't even think I mentioned that Joseph Clark was like close to six feet tall and like 200 pounds. And Thad was 13 and weighed like 90 pounds. I don't think I mentioned that, but for reference, that's how big this guy is. Who's just, he's smashing this kid to bits, dude. Like it's so messed up. It's like, I, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I have no words. I've been left speechless. Thank you, Joanne and Heather for the nightmares. So that night, again, Joseph wanted to leave the house, but he, this time he wanted to ensure that his victim would not try to escape again because he had underestimated him last time. So he took Thad and he put Thad inside of a closet and locked him inside the closet and then left the house so he could go and party with his girlfriend because priorities. While in that closet again, Thad was like, you know, <laughs> this is my time to shine. I got to do what I got to do. I got to see what I can do. So he looked around the closet and he saw an electric guitar and he's like, sure, why not? This could work. So he picks up the guitar with whatever strength he had in his body and he starts to beat repeatedly on the lock of the door until the lock broke and the door was able to be opened. And he was like, okay, let's, let's do this, man. So he starts to pull himself across the floor, pulling himself from the closet to the staircase again and periodically passing out from the pain. When he got to the edge of the stairs, he again threw himself down the stairs head first because it's the only way he could because he couldn't walk on his legs. And when he got to the bottom of the stairs, just like last time, he passed out and was again hopeful that when he woke up this time, Joseph wouldn't be there to um, punish him for leaving the room. And when he woke up, he found that he was still alone. And I can't even imagine how that felt like the relief, but the relief combined with like panic and adrenaline, knowing that you gotta, you gotta move and you gotta move as fast as you can. Cause you don't know when this guy's coming back. Dad then looked to the kitchen and on the kitchen wall, he saw a phone. Now, did this phone work? That was the question. He had already been duped before when um, trying to make a phone call, finding that the phone line just did not work. But he's like, you know what? I got to try. So he pulls himself through the house to the kitchen where he gets to the wall where the phone is. And luckily it's got like a cord that's hanging down. So he reaches up and he pulls it off the wall. He picks up the, the phone portion because it's like a house phone. He puts it to his ear. And there's a dial tone, dude. There is a dial tone. Not only is there a dial tone, but the part of the phone that was down had the buttons on it. So he obviously and immediately called 911. Thad told the dispatcher who he was, what had happened to him and the name of his captor's name. I mean, all he knew was that the guy's name was Joe. He didn't know his full name, but it, he told him what he, he told them what he did know. And they were able to trace the call. And once they did, they knew exactly where he was. And they told him like, Oh, listen, we, we know who this guy is. We are on our way. We have dealt with him before. He has a record even. Don't worry. We're going to get to you. We're going to save you. And they do do the police get there in time to actually save Thad's life. I mean, they were able to save him, but when they arrived, he was laying on the ground 
and his legs were twisted all the way around so that both of his feet were pointed in the opposite direction. Like it must have been a horrifying sight to see a kid that way. Once he got to the hospital, doctors realized just how bad his legs were, like what kind of shape they were in. And they were like, I don't know what we're going to do to save his mobility and make it so he could walk. But they did what they could. And he ended up requiring several surgeries over many years after the attack to repair his legs. But with these surgeries and some long-term medical care, Thad was able to walk and use his legs again. But he does still have a, a, a limp. Like he wasn't able to go without that. He also ended up suing Joseph Clark um, in a civil suit and he won. And the total payment was $21 million. The judge ordered Joe to pay him $31,566 in medical damages, $6 million in compensation damages, and $15 million in punitive damages. So anyway, back to the police finding Thad. They, f they get to the house, they find Thad. He's unconscious, but he's alive. So he's rushed to the hospital to save his life. And when he got there, he, he found when he woke up that he was just hours away from death because of the internal bleeding that he had in his body. Like if he hadn't gotten out when he did, he would have died. Like Joseph Clark had really messed him up. And once he did wake up and police were actually able to speak with him, this is when Thad told the police that his attacker, Joseph Clark, had told him that he was not the only victim that he had done this to, that he had gotten away with murdering two other boys. And he even had the name of one of these two boys. It was the only name that he could remember. But he told police that Joseph Clark had admitted to murdering a kid named Chris Steiner. And this name was not unknown to police. 14-year-old Chris Steiner had gone missing from his home the previous year, the same month a year earlier on July 3rd the day before the 4th of July weekend, when Joseph Clark was just 16 years old. Chris Steiner's mother had gone into her son's bedroom at about 6.15 a.m. to wake her son up for his morning shift at McDonald's. It was a new job that he had. And when she entered his room, she found that her young son's bed was empty and her boy was missing. Though he had been there when his father had went on to check on him, went on to check on him, <laughs> went in his room to check on him the night before at 10 p.m. So the police were called and when police entered the home, they felt that it was clear he had been kidnapped. There was a footprint in the earth outside one of the downstairs windows and the window screen had been cut open. There were also muddy footsteps inside the house that led towards the back door and the back door was left unlocked. They could literally see that someone had cut open the screen, entered through the window, went upstairs, picked up Chris Steiner and had just walked out the door. His family tried to stay optimistic, obviously, and hoped that he would come back. But sadly, six days later, um, his body was discovered in the Wisconsin River by two jet skiers. His body was like very badly decomposed due to its time in the water. So he had to be identified by his dental records. And when an autopsy was performed, they ruled his cause of death drowning, but his manner of death as undetermined. Chris's family, though, didn't actually think like they weren't suspecting that foul play was involved um, because they hadn't heard anything. And they assumed that if he had been kidnapped, they would have heard something going on in the in the house that night. So what they assumed happened is that a couple of Chris's friends had actually broken into the house, convinced him to leave to go swimming because it was like the 4th of July weekend um, and that something had just gone horribly wrong and that they were too afraid to admit it now that he had he had died. But now fast forward to Thaddeus Phillips claiming that Joseph Clark had admitted to murdering Chris Steiner. Like things were now, things were going to be looked at under a different lens. So with that, Chris Steiner's body was exhumed on August 3rd, 1995 to look for any evidence that this could be the case. They looked at Chris's body and performed x-rays and they then took these x-rays that showed many bone breaks in his legs, mind you, and they compared them to the x-rays that had been taken of Thad after his attack and found several consistencies. And they were now considering Chris's death to be a homicide. Now, why didn't they notice these breaks in uh, Chris Steiner's legs the first time around? I don't know. Maybe this was just like a really small town and it got, I, I, you know, you, you see this happen from time to time. It's disappointing, but it happens. Um, I know that there's a lot of bloating in the body. So the legs were bloated. So they didn't see anything outwardly that would look like the legs were broken. And I know that his legs weren't like completely twisted around and backwards the way that Thad's were. So somehow this was just missed and they didn't x-ray the legs because they didn't think there were any breaks. In addition to that, police noted that the proximity of these boys to Joseph Clark 
could make them easy targets. Both that and Chris Steiner lived pretty close to Joseph Clark and they would have been easy for him to see. Like it would have been easy for Joseph Clark to see these boys walking around on a daily basis because they lived close enough by that he could have just seen them and been watching them like this. Anyways, obviously police want to arrest Joseph Clark now. So they go back to his house to try to arrest him, hoping that maybe he's back there at this point, um, but he's not. So they search the home and said they're able to do this now. They got their warrants and everything. So they start to search the home. And while searching the home, they find some evidence that indicates to them that Thad and Chris Steiner are probably not the only intended victims for Joseph Clark because they find a notebook. And inside this notebook, there are the names of several teenage boys written down and he has these boys um, written in lists, three different lists, three different categories. And the lists were as follows. One, get to now. Two, can wait. And three, and the most chilling, just said, leg thing. Oh my God, bro, sir, what? No, oh my, no. Mm -mm. Joseph Clark was arrested that same night after he attended a party with his girlfriend. They had trouble finding him at first and they searched a bunch of like different parties because apparently there were a lot of parties in this area at the time, uh, but they were unable to find him. And how they ended up finding him is that the police um, stuck out, stuck out, did a stakeout at his home, knowing that he would eventually show up. And after four hours, four hours after Thad had placed his 911 call, Joseph Clark did return home and the police swarmed him and arrested him. When police arrested Joseph Clark, his first words to them were, oh, he's alive. And Thad 100% believes that Joseph Clark intended for him to die in that closet that night, that he was expecting to come back to a dead body waiting for him. And Thad says that the reason that he survived, um, the reason he thinks he survived is because he just had the willpower. He didn't want to leave his family and he didn't think his family would want to go on living without him. So he stayed strong and he fought and he lived. Joseph Clark's trial began on September 16th, 1996. And this was the trial for his assault on Thaddeus Phillips. And he ended up pleading no contest by reason of mental defect. And the defense argued that his biological mother had been a heavy drug user throughout her pregnancy with him. And they also discussed the fact that he had had that bad head wound when he was a youngster as contributing factors to why he had a mental defect. Thad was brave as hell though, dude. And he actually testified against Joseph Clark at his trial. He told all about the torture, all about the various different ways he would go about hurting him. He told the court that on several occasions after, after Joseph Clark would injure him, he would then pleasure himself in front of Thad, um, seemingly pleasuring himself to the um, cries and of pain this little boy was experiencing, which is a whole nother thing. It's a whole nother layer to what we've discussed and it's gross. Okay. Joseph testified that he didn't remember the attack, that he had frequent blackouts and that that's what had happened. Um, when Thad's legs got broken, that he had gone into a blackout. And when he woke up, he found Thad on his bed, crying in pain because of pain, crying in pain because of pain in his legs. He did say though, that despite not remembering anything because he was blacked out, he did remember that he never intended to kill Thad. Like that was never on the table. It wasn't that he blacked out and forgot about it. It's that that was never on the table. He was never going to kill him. It was just a big misunderstanding. Like everything in his life. And dude, something so weird that I found when looking into this case, why am I not looking at you? I'm like thinking, cause it's so weird. Is that somebody else, okay, between the time that Thad escaped, you know, Joseph's arrested and the trial taking place, somebody else tried to kill Thaddeus Phillips, dude. Like you can't make this up. This poor kid has been through, well, he's not a kid now. He's like a man, but he went through so much. Like I guess a 15 year old kid named Michael shot Thad. I saw it reported that he shot him in the arm. I also saw it reported that he shot him in the back. Now I could not find anything on if this shooting 
was related to the trial. If this, this person knew Joseph Clark, if he was trying to like kill him so he couldn't testify against him, how he was related, I couldn't find anything of that. What I could find was that this did delay Joseph Clark's trial because Thad was supposed to testify, but it did end up ended up it did end up happening eventually, and he did testify against him. And I just thought, I wish I could have found more on this, but I thought I had to mention it because it's absolutely crazy. If this had nothing to do with it, like I don't understand why everyone's trying to kill this kid. Um, I, I suspect that it did have something to do with it, but I have nothing to show for it. If anyone knows anything about this, please tell me because I couldn't find anything on it except for that it happened and it delayed the trial. And I need to know, need to. <laughs> but anyways, in the end, Joseph Clark ended up being sentenced to 100 years in prison for attempted first degree murder of Thaddeus Phillips. The following year, on November 3rd, 1997, Joseph Clark, who was now deemed the Bonebreaker Killer, went on trial again, but this was for the murder of Chris Steiner. The prosecution took photos, the x-rays of Chris Steiner's leg breaks um, and the, the x-rays of Thaddeus Phillips' leg breaks, and they put them up for, you know, the judge and the jury so that they could show that clearly both injuries were caused by the same monster. But of course, Joseph denied this. He said that he didn't even know Chris Steiner. He said he had seen him from time to time in the neighborhood and at school, but that they didn't know each other and that they had never spoke. But again, Thad testified at this trial and was like, I'm going to contradict everything you're saying because you told me that you very well did know him and that you murdered him, sir. So you clearly knew him pretty intimately. Um, his mom, uh, Joseph Clark's mom did testify on his behalf, giving him an alibi saying that the night that Chris Steiner was kidnapped, uh, Joseph was at home and never left, but they didn't really see this as credible. And there was proof that he often snuck out of the house and did so without being detected. So they didn't think that that was a very strong alibi. In the end for Chris Steiner's murder, Joseph Clark was found guilty and he was given a life sentence again without the possibility of parole plus an additional 50 years. I do know that he later tried to appeal or get his conviction overturned, but this was denied. So as far as I can tell, he is in jail. He will be in jail for the rest of his life. And truly, I'm kind of here for that because this guy to me seems incredibly dangerous and very scary. The fact that he could already do something this horrible at such a young age, and the fact that at only 16 years old, he already had such a specific torture method. And that, and that by 17, he had already successfully gotten away with murdering one child. It, it's, it's very, um, I'm not into it. And if that had not escaped, if that had not gotten away, he may have gotten away with it again, and he he may have gone on. I, I think he would have gone on to continue to do this over and over just because he was very like it feels like he was very ritualistic about it from the specific ways he broke the bones to him, like tending to the legs, putting them in braces, putting them in those white socks and having it be so pristine and perfect. And the fact that he had all those pairs of white socks and then the fact that he would like masturbate in front of him after hurting him. Like there was clearly something wrong with this kid. And to this day, he still takes no responsibility for what he did. He says that again, this is one of those things that um, is taken out of context and a big misunderstanding. Like you just don't understand what happens. He says first off that he didn't kidnap Thad, that it was never proven that he had forcibly removed him from his home. And the reason that that wasn't proven is because it didn't happen. <laughs> and that Thad had instead come with him by choice in the middle of the night. And he says that he didn't just like violently attack Thad out of nowhere, that the two had been arguing at his house and that from there um, he blacked out. And during his blackout, he had broken Thad's legs, but that it started as an argument that turned into a fight, um, which makes him seem less evil. You know what I mean? For, for what he did. <sighs> oh, bro, it'll just piss you off to hear this. He also said that though Thad was completely beaten, like he was real messed up, that there's no way to prove that Joe is the one who caused all these injuries. Because I mean, Thad did throw himself down the stairs several times trying to escape um, being captured. So some of those injuries were probably caused by him himself from throwing himself down the stairs. 
Okay. He also went on to say that there was nothing ritualistic about what was happening and that he didn't even own a bunch of white socks. He does not know where Thad got that information. Um, that he just had like rant, like socks, like a normal kid would have socks and that he wasn't like trying to do anything weird and ritualistic by wrapping him up. He was just trying to like cover him and he thought that maybe this would help his legs stop hurting since he was in so much pain. It would like hold them together, but he didn't try to get him any medical attention. So what else? What else? Is oh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He said that he never masturbated in front of Thad. That was just a plain lie. He doesn't know why Thad made that up. That just came out of his brain out of nowhere that it wasn't possible that he did this during a blackout. Like that wasn't it. That's just flat out never happened. He never did this depraved act. Like that's just a bold faced lie. He also says that he never told Thad that he had done this to two boys prior to him and that he definitely didn't mention Chris Steiner's name because he didn't know him and doesn't know where Thad pulled that out. Well, I guess he thinks Thad pulled it out of his but, but what he actually said is he thinks that the DA put these thoughts in Thad's head because even though this case had already been done and he was already buried and the case was closed, the DA still thought that somebody had killed him. So they were trying to like frame him and using Thad's uh, mur attempted murder to do that. Oh, and that notebook, the notebook found in Joseph Clark's room, the one with the different list of boys' names, one of them literally just saying leg thing, right? That wasn't his guys. Like, don't get it twisted. That was a notebook that belonged to a friend of his who had just left it at his house. It wasn't even his. So nothing to look at here. Now, do, do you believe any of that? Because I definitely don't. I think this was just a messed up kid with some really dark fantasies who went on to do hellish things and would have continued to go on to do hellish things if he had not been caught. And now as an adult, he's just lying about it. That's what I think man, I would just love to know. I'm just so, I I'm just so interested to know what could damage a kid so badly because he was so young. Like clearly there's something there. Um, the head injury may be combined with some sort of nurture components. I mean, the house was pretty messed up, like the conditions he was living in. I can't imagine what his childhood was actually like, but regardless of that, I'm just curious and I'm mostly more than curious. I'm just happy that he is behind bars and that he can't hurt any more kids the way he hurt Thad and Chris Steiner and maybe another kid since Thad said that there were two kids, two kids that he mentioned. Um, there could be somebody else out there that we don't even know about. And that's incredibly, incredibly sad and scary. And uh, it's just messed up. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative and it gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, I want to thank you for remembering Thad Phillips and Chris Steiner with me today because their case is very horrifying and worth remembering and discussing. What happened to these two boys is honestly horrifying and unthinkable. I can't imagine what they went through and I cannot imagine what these kids' parents felt like. Chris's parents missing their baby forever and having to know what their child likely went through because Thad lived to tell the tale. So they know exactly what Thad went through. So they have this idea of what their child's final moments were like, and they were the stuff of nightmares. And Thad's parents having to deal with knowing that this happened to their kid and having to navigate all the psychological trauma that would be involved after something like this happens. And then Thad himself having to live with that trauma as well. It's just like, all around super messed up. That's an understatement, but it's a statement I'm going with. Gather around and let me tell you the story of Mary Vincent, one of the toughest chicks I have ever heard of. Our story begins in Las Vegas, Nevada in 1978, where 15 year old Mary Vincent lives with her parents, her father Herb, who is a slot machine repairman in Vegas, and her mother Lucy, who is a casino car dealer, along with her six siblings. There isn't a ton available on Mary Vincent's uh, early years prior to the just tragic situation that's bringing you and I here together today, um, but from what I read and from the vibe I got from Mary herself in different interviews that I watched, it didn't seem like a healthy or happy situation growing up with Mary and her family. So one day in 1978, Mary received a phone call from her sister informing her that her father had a migraine 
was in a terrible mood, was specifically mad at Mary, and was on his way home. So Mary decided she wanted to avoid the situation altogether and chose, instead of dealing with her father and whatever was coming with that, to run away from home, from her home in Las Vegas, Nevada, to California. Mary has said in interviews that when she left home that day, she was running for her life, if that gives you any indication of her home life again. And it's so tragic because in running for her life from her father, she ended up almost losing her life to a stranger. 15-year-old Mary Vincent did make it to California. She actually made it all the way to Berkeley, California, where she stayed with an uncle who lived there at the time. But after a while of staying there, she decided that she was homesick and she wanted to head home. Young girl, tired of being away from her family as you know, turmoil as it may have been, she wanted to go home, but for whatever reason, and I couldn't determine exactly what the reason was, she was going to go first to her grandfather's house in Los Angeles, California, before heading back to Las Vegas, Nevada. So since it was the 70s, how did people get around? They hitchhiked. So in September of 1978, 15-year-old Mary stood along the side of the road with her thumb out to passing cars with a couple of other teenagers. Mary stood on the side of the road with a sign that said, heading south, um, hoping and praying that one of the cars going in that direction would, you know, stop and give her a ride home, and she thought it was her lucky day. When a kind old man, a man that she said reminded her of a friendly grandfather figure, offered her a ride. The man was driving a blue van, and he informed Mary that he wasn't going all the way to Los Angeles, like that wasn't his plan, but that he would happily take a detour to get her there, but the catch was that even though it was a van and the back was mostly empty, he informed 15-year-old Mary that he could only take her, only one person, only the 15-year-old girl and not the other teenagers that were thumbing with her. These weren't her friends or anything, but they were people that were there. And when the man said this, the, the other kids that were with her were like, that's a little sketchy, the fact that this old man will only take you, a young girl. And Mary, you know, she ignored them. She ignored the signs. She was super exhausted. She describes in interviews being just so, so tired. And she said that he seemed really nice. So she didn't, didn't think about who he was or what sort of danger he could be. And she got inside the van alone. While the two drove, the man started telling Mary stories about his life and his family. And she started to feel even more comfortable with him because, you know, he was just breaking her walls down, so exhausted, Mary actually fell asleep in this guy's van. Once Mary woke up and started looking around, she realized that she was in a van with this man and it was going the wrong direction. She looked at the signs and she realized like, oh, we're not, we're not going to LA. So she started to panic a little bit and she looked around the interior of the truck and she saw at her feet a surveyor stick, which I had to look this up, I didn't know what that was. And it's like a measuring stick, I believe, that's used for people who work in some sort of construction, home restoration. So she picked it up to arm herself and she's like, yo, listen, you're not going to LA. I think you know that you need to, you need to take me to where I'm going or you need to let me out of this van. And he was like, oh, no, 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 oh, my God, my, my bad, I missed the turn, I'm so sorry. Let me just pull over, use the restroom, and we'll get right back on track. No big deal, it's not a problem. So he goes and he pulls off on a deserted road. And it's at this point that Mary really starts to panic. So as this van pulls to a stop on the deserted road, Mary is assessing her situation. She's like, okay, I need to figure out what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to need to run for it. This guy is old, probably unhealthy. He's like a grandfather. I'm a young, wiry 15-year-old girl. I need to run for it. And when she looks down, she realizes her shoe's untied. And she's like, I should probably tie that so I can book it, right? So he pulls over. He gets out of the truck. He's doing his thing. She gets out so that she can tie her shoe. And this is when this man sneaks up behind her and hits her in the back of the head with a sledgehammer, completely knocking her out cold. When Mary woke up again, this poor 15-year-old girl, don't forget, this is a 15-year-old girl, was in an actual nightmare. She was fully nude, tied up in the back of this man's van, and when he woke up, he proceeded to rape her. He raped her several times. In an interview, I saw that throughout the night, he raped her approximately six times, and when she would ask him, why are you doing this? He gave her no answer. Eventually, this man fell asleep, 
but Mary never went to sleep. She was awake the entire night, laying in the back of this van, unable to move because she was tied up, and just praying for death, praying for it to just be over. Before the man fell asleep, she kept pleading with the man, please just set me free. Please just let me go. I'll never tell anyone, but he just never answered her. The following morning, this man pulled Mary Vincent, 15-year-old Mary Vincent, from the back of the van, naked, alone, in a deserted area. And she pleaded with him and she cried to him, please let me go, please just set me free. And this man said to her, oh, you want to be set free? I'll set you free. And then he reached in the van and pulled a hatchet from his toolbox. The man then grabbed Mary's arm and struck it twice with the hatchet and Mary fell to the ground. He had chopped Mary's arm off below her elbow and she was awake the whole time. She felt all the pain. She called it excruciating pain. She said it felt like burning and stinging and that she could feel the hot blood leaking from her body. He then grabbed Mary's right arm while she laid on the ground and she started to freak out and kick at him and scream at him and plead and just hope that somebody around would hear her, but they were totally alone. She was totally alone and he proceeded to chop off her right arm. So Mary's laying on the ground at this point and she's bleeding and she's in pain and she looks over and she sees that her attacker is like flinging his arm in the distance. So she looks and to her horror, okay, she sees that what this man is doing is trying to fling Mary's arm off his arm because she had been gripping him so hard during the attack that even though he had chopped her arm off, it was still grabbing onto his arm. That is the stuff of nightmares. So this man comes back to Mary while she's laying on the ground and he starts to drag her. And as he does this, Mary plays dead. And this asshole, asshole takes Mary to the edge of a cliff and throws 15 year old Mary Vincent off a 30 foot cliff. This probably should have killed her, right? She has a head injury. She has both of her arms cut off. She's been thrown off a cliff. But miraculously, she only breaks four ribs during this fall. And she's laying there and her body goes into shock. Mary lay on the ground, bleeding and beaten, but alive. But completely unsure what to do. Not sure if the man is gone, not sure if she can move, and she's she's bleeding out. She got very tired, she got very cold, and she she just wanted to go to sleep, right? She's laying there, she's she wants to go to sleep, but the thought keeps popping into her head that she can't sleep, that if she sleeps, she's not gonna wake up, she's gonna die, and this guy could do this to someone else, and she couldn't let this guy do this to someone else. These are the thoughts that's going through this young girl's head as she lay at the bottom of a cliff after being thrown off, after being repeatedly raped, after having her arms cut off. She's like, I can't let him do this to another girl. So she fights the urge to fall asleep and she stays awake and she's like, okay, I gotta, I gotta save myself here. So she, okay, <laughs> this is gonna blow your mind. She takes her stubs, she digs them in the dirt to pack her wounds, to make a mud, to stop the bleeding and she climbs up the cliff with no arms. This child, after going through all that, climbs up a freaking cliff with no arms. After, Can you imagine how bad that would hurt to like pack it with dirt and then to climb up that hill and you're bleeding and you're... It's a lot. It's like a lot. It took Mary forever to climb the cliff and by the time she had gotten to the top and back to the road it was nightfall and she could see nothing the only light there was was moonlight and starlight to illuminate her surroundings and she went into the middle of the road and just started walking towards the sounds of cars in the distance because she figured there must be a freeway that way so this girl naked bloody no arms is just walking down the middle of a road alone in the dark mary walked all night and at daybreak, she saw her first car. It was like a red convertible sports car. And inside it carried two like young men. They took one look at her, saw her 
bloody and naked and with no arms and they drove right past her and left her alone which is just so horrible like I, I, I get that it must have been like a terrifying sight to see but that's just so sad I can't imagine how defeated she must have felt at that moment the second car that came upon Mary was a young honeymooning couple driving a truck who had like taken a wrong turn and just happened to be on that road so it was completely luck and coincidence and they saw Mary standing naked in the center of the road covered in blood and she had her arms raved, raised above her head not just to signal a car but also to stop the blood from leaking out of her body and to keep her alive longer so they pulled over and they immediately helped her they scooped her up they put her in their vehicle they wrapped her in whatever kind of cloth they had and they drove as quickly as they could to a phone because this is the 70s there's no cell phone so they drive as quick as they can to a phone the couple called the paramedics and a rescue helicopter came and airlifted mary to a hospital doctors determined that mary had lost half of the blood that belonged in her body and the blood that was remaining was at a toxic level but even though she was in such bad shape mary went on at the hospital to immediately give police a description of her attacker so that they could put together a composite sketch and this composite sketch looked just like him like her memory was ridiculously good and her memory was so good that it only took 10 days for police to find arrest and a charge her attacker a man named lawrence singleton lawrence singleton was a 51 year old former marine who was recently divorced with a daughter the same age as mary so fucking gross so gross Apparently, if you didn't already know, he was a pretty shitty guy and he used to abuse both his ex-wife and his daughter. So, just an all-around shit person, if you know. You didn't already get that from the raping and cutting off of a girl's arms and throwing her off a cliff thing, you know. The next time Mary Vincent saw her attacker was in 1979 at her court trial and she was terrified to be there because he was only 10 feet away from her while she testified against him but she put all of that fear aside and she went up on the stand and she told her story. And what's so badass is at the trial she looked at him and pointed at him with her new prosthetic arm and was like that's the guy who attacked me which is just so powerful this guy was such a dick because as mary was leaving the courthouse she had to walk past him and she heard him say that if it's the last thing he did he would finish the job so she had to hear that and live with that fear lauren singleton was found guilty and convicted of the attempted attempted murder and the rape and he was given a whopping 14 years apparently at the time this was the max sentence that he could get for that type of crime and i would just like to know what you think about that i hate how light the sentencing is sometimes for things like attempted murder because like okay he intended to kill her he did everything in his power to murder this girl i mean he chopped off her arms and threw her off a cliff like why should he get a lighter sentence because this chick was strong enough and resilient enough to live why should he get a lighter sentence because he's bad at murdering people like that just ir irritates me oh no oh no that irritates me apparently the judge in the trial agreed with my sentiment here and said at the trial that if he had the power he would have sent lawrence singleton to jail for the rest of his natural life but the laws are the laws there's nothing he could do about that and it's just unfortunate but our system's just a little bit a little bit you know it just is and here is a little bit more information to irritate you along with me about the Lawrence Singleton situation. So he was sentenced to 14 years, right? He only served eight years and was released early because of good behavior and only given one year parole. Even more irritating, when Lawrence Singleton was released from prison, he went on to try to sue Mary. He says that Mary's version of events never happened, that what really happened is he was just a nice old man and did a nice thing by picking up this young girl. But once she got in his van, she was a totally different person. And she started smoking PCP, okay? And then she grabbed the stick off the ground and threatened him and was like, hey, if you do not give me drugs, no, excuse me, if you do not give me more money to buy drugs, I'm gonna tell people you raped me. He 
also said that it wasn't only Mary that he picked up in the beginning, that he actually took those other two hitchhikers, you remember the two that were with her, and that he let them drive and he sat in the back and got super duper drunk, and that when he woke up, Mary was gone, but her clothes were still there, so if something happened to her, it was one of the other hitchhikers who did it, not him. And that's why he sued her, because she lied, apparently. And obviously he didn't win this lawsuit, because it's ridiculous, but the audacity of him. Can you even imagine how that felt for her? Because, okay, at this time she would be in her early 20s, and she's just trying to deal with all the trauma of what happened to her, and the light sentencing, and first off, she knows that this guy just got out of jail, and that he promised that he was going to come back and finish the job. And then he tries to sue you and calls you a liar. Like, all of it is just such a miscarriage of justice. And it's just so fucked up. It's just, it's so sad. It's so sad. The audacity. When Lawrence Singleton got released in California, there were actual protests in the area because the community did not want him to live there, which I think is just like wild and awesome that people came together that way. But because he was on parole, he had to stay in the area. So he ended up living in a trailer, like on the prison grounds until his parole was up one whopping year later. And then he relocated to Florida. Now, did Lawrence stay out of trouble in Florida? Were, you know, was he cured of his murderous, rapey ways? No, of course not. About 10 years after his release from prison, Lawrence was rearrested and convicted of first degree murder after he picked up a 31 year old woman and mother of three named Roxanne Hayes and stabbed her to death in his home in her face and chest and stomach. Mary Vincent flew out to testify against him at this murder trial. She didn't have to be there, but I'm sure her, her testimony was incredibly powerful in showing just what a piece of absolute this guy was. And just like with Mary's case, he tried to say that this murder also wasn't his fault, that this woman, like Mary, was a totally different person than they thought, that she, after he brought her home, she had tried to kill him and threatened to decapitate him. So as the two were struggling over the knife, she stabbed herself in the face and the chest and the stomach. Because again, the audacity. His story, of course, wasn't believed. Nobody was falling for that. And he was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to death. However, he would never be put to death by the state because he instead died of cancer in prison on death row in 2001 at the age of 74. And this is all, you know, completely terrible. This case is so messed up, but, if, but you know, for a silver lining, just like in the case of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman and Kitty Genovese, something terrible always seems to have to happen before things are put into place to better protect us citizens. And from this situation, there was new laws put into place that apparently um, would make it so that if a similar crime like this had happened, the minimum sentencing would be drastically different and nobody else would get, you know, just 14 years. Oh, excuse me. Eight years with good behavior. So for Mary, as I'm sure you can imagine, things are pretty rough for her at first, you know, learning how to live and cope and deal and just be a, a person again, you know? But eventually she did get it together and she actually ended up marrying and having two sons and this greatly enriched her life having her boys and having something good to focus on and live for. I don't believe Mary is still married because I did read that she uh, has like a hot young new boyfriend which like go marry but I did read that when her now ex-husband first proposed to her it was really sweet because she, you know, can't wear a ring because she has prosthetic arms. So he actually gave her like a diamond on a silver chain to wear on her neck. And I thought that was just like a sweet little thing I wanted to mention to you, like something nice in all, all of this. She still struggles with PTSD and nightmares as, you know, I'm sure you can imagine one would, um, but she's making the best out of her situation with her sons. She has a couple dogs and a bird and she seems like a well-adjusted, if albeit a little sad person. I just have like a soft spot and love for her. I have a love and a soft spot for her animal lovers in general. And she, you know, she has her dog and her birds, or bird and her dogs. Mary has gone on to become a professional artist. And she says that she was first a victim, then a survivor, 
and now an artist, which I feel like is a pretty beautiful way to, to put her situation. And she does like um, commissioned work where she'll draw you with pencil or do chalk pastels. And the work that she does like just independently without commissions is all illustrations of like strong and powerful women, women ironically. And she does all of this with her prosthetic arms. And for her prosthetic, she started with like cheap prosthetic arms that didn't move. And this woman tinkers. She says she's a tinkerer and she makes her own prosthetics to make them more movable and more functional to do the things she likes to do, like paint or play pool or go bowling. This woman makes her own prosthetics so that she can paint and play pool and go bowling and just live her life and have fun. And I think that is just so cool, dude. So cool. In addition to being an artist, she has also started the Mary Vincent Foundation, which I believe is actually pronounced the Marie Vincent Foundation based on um, how it's spelled. This foundation helps children and adolescents who have fallen victim to sexual assault or children and adolescents who are suffering from sexual sexually deviant behavior, which I think is such a great thing for her to do. And I will link the organization down below in case you want to read more about it, because obviously there's a lot more to it than I could tell you right now. But I think it's a really great thing for her to do. But that, my friends, is the story of Mary Vincent, a victim, a survivor, and an artist. What do you think? Isn't it just so incredibly wild? I cannot imagine going through that and having the strength that she did I don't think that I could have done that even now like as a child to 15 to I don't think I would have had the strength to dig my cut off arms into the dirt and pull myself up a cliff naked and in pain and alone after everything else that she went through I don't I don't think I could have done it I think that's a special type of person but I don't know maybe I could have maybe this is um one of those stories that shows you just how resilient and strong and powerful you are as a person. You know what I mean? It just doesn't sound possible when you put yourself in that, without being in that position, just, just to imagine it, it sounds impossible. And then for the guy who did that, to only get 14 years, and then to get out in eight, and then to go out and murder another woman, it's just so upsetting because it's so avoidable and it's so obvious that this guy was going to go on to hurt somebody else like you don't do what he did you don't kidnap a child rape her over and over cut her arms off while she's still alive and throw her off a cliff and get rehabilitated that's not something that's just like a fluke you know what i mean like that's a that's a problem he was a clearly dangerous person that should have been kept in jail and if he had this other woman this other mother would still be alive you know it's just I feel like Mary's story is a cautionary tale and not like for hitchhiking in general because I feel like we've kind of moved past that as a society mostly, but just for like the trusting nature with strangers because Mary ignored what were some very clear red flags because she trusted this man because he was an older, softer, grandfather looking guy who like told her about his life and like lulled her into a, a false sense of security. And like, I don't feel like people should go around scared of all strangers, but man, like you gotta be cautious because this guy was gnarly and there's other people like that. This is the first thing that they know of that he did. So, I mean, I'm sure he did other things, but if this was the first thing that he ever did, like, it's scary to think that that could be inside of somebody who's seemingly so normal. You know what I mean? Just like with the Chris Watts thing, somebody who had never done anything before to be able to do something so horrible. Like, I just wouldn't want something like this to ever happen to another person, you know? And then this case, like, freaks me out because it makes me think about, okay, so there are two notable times in my life and I'm I was born in 88 so like I knew better we were past this at this point but there's two times in my life that I have accepted a ride from a stranger that I have I wasn't hitchhiking but there was a time one time in specific where I was in Las Vegas and me and a friend got in a car with a man that we did not know because you know stupid girls drunk in Vegas it was like four four or five in the morning and as soon as we got in his car he informed us that he had just gotten out of jail <laughs> and was on parole <laughs> and that's like you know that's I digress that's a story that's not about this but it makes me think of times like that and how easy you know ugh. anyway come gather around and let me tell you the horrifying story of the attempted murder of Marty Hill 
Now I want to start this video off with a quote. This is a quote from Marty herself when describing what happened to her. Marty said, quote, I was left for dead, crumpled in a five foot wide pool of blood, my throat and neck cut in three places, my skull broken, my face beaten, unable to be recognized by my own mother, my own children. Against all odds, I survived. Our story today begins in a place called Prairie Village, Kansas, which is a, an area that is inside Kansas City, which is actually, fun fact, an area that I lived when I was younger. I lived in Kansas City, but Prairie Village is this little area that's near the border of Kansas and Missouri, and this is where Marty Hill lived. Marty is a tiny but mighty woman. Described as barely 100 pounds soaking wet, she was said to be a bunch of dynamite in a tiny little package. She was genuine, good, well she is, because she's alive, right? Genuine, good-hearted, outgoing, fun, the type of person to always try and make everything around her better. Marty was the type of person to get things done. She was very hardworking and very reliable. And that is why on September 8th, 2010, when Marty didn't show up for work and didn't tell anybody she wasn't coming, this was an immediate red flag for the people who worked with her. It was a totally normal day at Marty's office. She worked for an apparel company, like a manufacturing place, and she worked as a graphic designer. And the day was totally normal going as usual, except that Marty didn't show up. Marty was meant to be there at 8 a.m. And as the minutes passed and she didn't show up, it was noticed. But the people that she worked with weren't trying to freak out right away. They thought it was weird, but they were like, oh, maybe she got a flat tire, maybe her phone's dead, whatever, whatever. It was weird, but they weren't going to freak out. But then it was 10 a.m., two hours after she was supposed to be there. And they had a production meeting. I believe they did this weekly. And Marty was supposed to be there. And when she didn't show up, two of her coworkers noticed right away. Jan and Stephanie were like, what the heck? She's not here. This makes no sense. Because again, hardworking, reliable, always there. She wouldn't not show up. That was already something she wouldn't do. But to not show up and not text for them and tell them that she wasn't coming in, that was like unheard of for her. The company that she worked for, it was super small, super close knit. They told each other like everything on the day to day that was going on in their lives. If you've ever worked for a small company like that, you'll get what I mean. The law firm that I worked at that I recently in the last year stopped working at, the staff was so small, like the support staff was so small that all of us were in a group chat together. And that is how we communicated everything. We wouldn't even tell our boss when we weren't coming in, we would text each other and let each other know when we weren't going to be coming in because that's just the kind of work environment that we had. And that seems to be the type of vibe that Marty's work had from everything that I've read. She loved her job. She loved her coworkers, actually. And they were all super close. They were close. And most importantly, they communicated with each other regularly. So anyways, once that meeting that Marty didn't show up for was over, they kind of got together and were like, what the hell? Like, where's Marty? So Stephanie, her coworker, texts her, gets no response. They call her several times they get no answer. And this is when they realize they need to figure out what's wrong. Like this is so out of character for her that they can't ignore it anymore. And they need to try to figure out like where she is and what happened. This is when Marty's coworkers go to Marty's boss. This is a guy named Tom. And they tell him like, we are worried. They were super freaked out by this point. Apparently when they were telling him this, some of them had even started to tear up. I think that really shows just how weird this was for her that you would start like tearing up right away. Right. So they go to him. They're like, this is what's going on. And he's like, okay, okay, don't worry. Let's not freak out. She could just be asleep. We don't know what's going on. I will go over there. I will go to her house and I will see what's up. He gets in his car and he drives over to Marty's house. She lived in this quiet little residential area. It's about 1130 in the morning. He parks, he gets out, he goes to the door. He knocks on the door. He gets no answer. He rings the doorbell. He gets no answer. And he's like, that's odd because Marty's car is like right there in the driveway. So why isn't she answering? He ends up walking around the house and he doesn't see anything odd. There's nothing specific that makes that would look, you would look at and be like, okay, this is fucking weird. But for whatever reason, he did get a bad feeling. So he goes back to the car. He calls the office and he's like, okay, I think it's time that we call the cops and request a welfare check because something seems off here. Now they didn't have to jump to this because Marty had a daughter. They could have just called Marty's daughter. She was a teenager and she lived with her mom, but they didn't want to like freak her out. She was 15. She was at school. And yes, maybe she could have an idea where her mom is, but if she didn't, this would just put like a teenager under undue stress, stress that they don't need to be under when we don't even know if something's really going on. So they decided to just jump right over that option and go straight to the cops, which is actually very good that they did. Anyways, the cops are called and they arrive. And then officer Bill Baldwin, officer Bill. He says that this area is not an area that they get a lot of calls to. Like it's a very nice area. It's a nice area to live in. If they get any calls there, it's usually like property crime. It's never violent crime. So he gets there, he goes up to the door and he finds that 
it is closed, but it's not locked. So he kind of cracks it open to see what he can see. And he just kind of calls in like, hello, hello, this is police. I am the cops. Marty, are you there? Can you hear me? Now, as I'm sure you can guess, he doesn't get any response. So he kind of peers in and right there, like right off the door, he can see that Marty's purse is on the kitchen table. And he thinks to himself like, okay, her purse on the kitchen table, her car's outside. There's no way that she's gone anywhere without these things. He's like, I have a wife. And my lady, she doesn't go anywhere without her purse. So if she hasn't gone anywhere, that means she's here. And if she's not responding, she may be hurt. So Officer Bill makes his way into the home. He searches the first level. He doesn't find anything. He goes up to the second level. She had a second level, right? I feel like she did. I'm 99% sure she did. He searches that. He finds nothing. And then he's like, oh, there's a basement up in this bitch. So he goes to the basement and he has a flashlight, but it's still pretty dark and he's shining it down there. And the entire time that he's going down the stairs, he's like, hello, hello, this is police. Because he wants to make sure that if she is home and she just couldn't hear him and she's just down there, you know, doing her laundry or doing a workout, whatever one does in a basement, I don't have a basement, that she knows it's the cops and doesn't get freaked out to see a man with a flashlight coming down her stairs. Now, it was so dark in that basement that Officer Bill didn't see anything weird immediately. It took for him to get to almost the very bottom of the steps before he saw a a horrifying sight. He sees a person, a woman, in the fetal position in a giant pool of blood. Like, apparently there was just, like, so much blood, and the person was covered in blood from head to toe. She was described, like, he could tell nothing about her. She was so caked in blood that he actually thought that she was a black woman because it had covered all of her skin with, you know, a darker color. And, spoiler alert, Marty is is white, white-ish. She looks, she's pale. Her skin is light. And so that is how covered in blood she was. She was just laying there in the fetal position, not moving. So he looks at her, and he can't tell if she's dead or alive. But then all of a sudden, she turns towards him. And that's when he's like, okay, she's clearly alive because she's moved. And when he looks at her, he can now see like the extent of her injuries. He says that her head was like so swollen, like very, very swollen. And she had a deep wound to her throat. So at this, the officer got down to her level so that he could like be there with her and for her. And he can tell that she is breathing, but it is labored breathing. So he just keeps asking her over and over like, Marty, who did this to you, Marty? What happened? Because he thought that he might be taking like a dying declaration. He didn't know if she was going to live based on how she looked. And he was hoping he could get something out of her, but she didn't say anything. So from there, Marty was rushed to St. Luke's Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, and the officer actually rode in the ambulance with her. And once she was at the hospital, she was wheeled into emergency surgery. They were like, we need to get on this immediately. The doctor who was going to be performing her surgery, this was Dr. Harry, said that when Marty was wheeled in, she was in such bad shape that he couldn't tell anything about her, couldn't tell her gender, couldn't tell her age. All he knew is that he had this lifeless form here who was covered in blood with a severely swollen head. And looking her over, he was able to tell that she had been seriously beaten and that most of the assault had taken place to her head. She was very beaten, as I said, very swollen. And they were able to tell that there were several fractures to her skull and to her face. She had a concussion and there was swelling of the actual brain. And this is already like very, very bad. And then on top of that, she had that deep cut to her throat and the cut had gone through a bunch of, you know, like veins and her muscle like it really was a deep cut and apparently it even nicked her carotid artery and if they had cut all the way through that artery she definitely would have bled out and this would have been a different story that we'd be telling today like she was so bad that okay i learned in this case while researching this case that in the medical field there are five levels of trauma and for level one the person only has a 20 to 25 percent chance of surviving and marty was a level one That's how rough this was. And one of the officers that was working her case even said that this was like the worst case they had ever worked on during their entire career as like a police officer. So she went into surgery and the doctors did everything they could to try to save her, to try to put her back together again. And fortunately they were able to, they brought her out of the surgery and that had been successful. But what they were really worried about now was that head injury because head injuries are so tricky. People with injuries similar to Marty's could seem fine. Like they've seen it where the person seems fine. It seems like things are going good. And then a couple of hours later, they're just gone. The doctor who worked on Marty, Dr. Harry was local too. So this really freaked him out. He got so freaked out that he actually called his wife and his kids to make sure they were okay. And he said that the enormity of what had happened to this woman was just hitting him in waves throughout the whole experience. So all of this is happening. And meanwhile, her coworkers are still at work, freaking out, not knowing what's going on. Just like 
did a welfare check. What's going on? They're at work trying to do work. Can't do work. Can't focus. So one of them actually goes back to Marty's house. And when they get there, they see like the cop presence and, you know, caution tape, all that jazz. So they go and they ask somebody like, what's going on? And all they're able to learn is that there's like a ton of blood. So this person goes back, reports it to the other coworkers, and they're all freaking the fuck out because they don't know if she's dead or alive. So once Marty was out of surgery, her family was finally able to see her. And Marty's mom went and picked up Marty's daughter. Because remember, Marty is a mother. She has a daughter named Mackenzie and a son named Stephen. So grandma picks up Mackenzie. They go over to the hospital and they go to the ICU. And they have no idea what they're getting themselves into. They know she's been injured, but they don't know the extent of the injuries. And they didn't even know that it was a person that was responsible for what happened to Marty. When Marty's daughter Mackenzie saw her mother, she said that she just started to fall because she didn't even recognize her. She said all she could see that looked familiar to her to let her know it was her mother was her hands because her head, again, was swollen. It was swollen to three times its normal size and her eyes were swollen shut. She had stitches like around her eyebrow and then this giant wound that was stitched up on her neck. So even though she couldn't recognize her mother, she could see that she had been through hell. And this is so scary because I can't imagine seeing my mom in this condition at all. But she also said that her mom's eyes, though they were swollen shut, tears would fall out of like the corners, the sides of her eyes. And the tears that came out were like blood. She started to feel bad thinking of how in her teenage years she had just been so sassy with her mom. And she started thinking about all of those arguments, those stupid arguments that you get into over those stupid teenager things. Because seeing her mom in this state made her just feel bad about everything bad that had ever happened between them. She said she wished she could take it all back. She said that she like got really close to her mom and whispered in her ear, like, I will never be mean to you again. I'm so sorry. She was just crying. All she wanted was to talk to her mom. But at this point, they don't even know if she's going to survive. Her family went on to keep like a constant vigil for her next to her bed and kept a photo of her from before the attack next to her bed as well. So the hospital staff could see what she actually looked like before this had happened. Shirley's son, Stephen, was very angry. Apparently, he was really affected by what happened to his mom. He was very, very protected, protective of her. And for this to happen was very hard. Um, he didn't live locally anymore. He had actually moved to Texas. So after what happened, he flew back so that he could be there with his mom. And he was just like a very, he had a lot of anger to work through about it. And I guess he was the one, like when they went back to Marty's house, after all was said and done, he went in and he was the first one to see the blood. And once he saw it, he wouldn't let anyone in like down there. He's like, no, 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 no one else is going to see this. No one else is going to be part of this. And he was the one who actually cleaned up his own mother's blood. And Marty's mother, her name was Shirley. She was just in disbelief. She said her stomach was in knots. She just could not understand how somebody could do this to her daughter. Everyone was scared, scared that Marty wouldn't make it, but also scared that Somebody else could be a target. They didn't know who did this or why they did it. So her family was worried. Even her coworkers were worried that somehow this could be related to work. They were looking around and everybody they saw, they were like, could this be the person? Could this even be someone that we know that's just hiding in plain sight? So investigation. One of the first things that police noticed when looking at this case and Marty in particular, when she was found was her clothing. And the fact that her clothing was still on, she was fully dressed. Her bra was on her shirt, like everything was on and nothing had been like moved. Nothing was like hiked up. Right. You know, you know, the visual that I'm talking about here. So they had determined just visually that they didn't believe that this had been a sexual assault. This is one of the first things they looked into because so often we see when a woman is attacked and it's a random act of violence, the motive is that of a sexual nature. But, and then they can take that and they can zero in on a suspect. But in Marty's case, that didn't seem to be the motive. Police spoke to Marty's neighbors, but they didn't get a ton of information. The only real lead they got was that one neighbor said that they had seen like a red beat up pickup truck at about 8 a.m. near Marty's house and that the person who was driving it was like a small statured younger white dude. That was pretty much all they had to go on. Police also go to Marty's work so they can speak to her coworkers, the people she spends the most time with to get an idea of who she was, who she interacted with, what her day to day routine was. But this also was not helpful. But that's not to say that speaking to those that knew Marty was not helpful as a whole, because in speaking to Marty's mother, Shirley, they actually did get some helpful information. They questioned Marty's mother at the hospital, which sounds so traumatic to me, but also I get it. You want to interview people as quickly as possible so you can get the case solved as quickly as possible. But it just sounds like it'd be very hard to do. But they speak to her and they ask her, like, is there anyone out there that you could think of that would want to hurt 
Marty? Does she have anyone in her life, any romantic interest, E C D C? And that's when she tells them that, yes, Marty had been married. She has an ex-husband. His name is Steve. They had divorced like seven years earlier, but they had regular communication, regular contact because they had joint custody of their daughter. That's really all she could think of, though. She said she didn't think her daughter was like dating anyone, not out there seeing dudes. Apparently, Marty was such a workaholic. She didn't really have time to be out there meeting mans. And if she wasn't at work, she was at home. Again, not out there meeting new mans. That was really all they could go on at this point, though, because Marty was still unconscious. They couldn't ask her if she had been seeing somebody. They couldn't ask her who did this. They couldn't ask her if she had a guest or anything. All they had was what her mother said. So police start looking into Steve, and in doing so, they question the couple's daughter, and they ask her, like, hey, how were your parents? What was their relationship like? Any fights? Anything weird? ETC, ETC. And Mackenzie got very insulted by this and very defensive about this because, like, that was her dad. She was like, my father, sirs police people would never do this. Nobody I know would ever do something like this. You've got to be looking for a stranger because you're barking up the wrong tree, my guy. Regardless of this, police do go to Steve's house that night to interview him. And apparently he was very cooperative. He invited them into his home. He sat down and gave them a full accounting of his day, his alibi, and told them all about his and Marty's relationship, even delving into some of the things that were like, like the less rose tinted parts of one's relationship. So he wasn't really hiding anything. And they really got the impression from him that he was heartbroken, that he really loved her, he would never hurt her, and that he truly wanted to know who had done this to her. Steve had an alibi for that morning. And his alibi that he told police was that he dropped his daughter off at school, and then he went to work. But of course, his alibi needs to be confirmed. So in the meantime, he's not allowed to see his daughter until they can confirm his alibi, which was very traumatizing for him and also very traumatizing for Mackenzie, because in her mind, he could never do this, right? And she was just a kid. And now her mom was hurt. And she couldn't see her dad. It was just very sad. But, you know, cops got a cop. They got a DNA sample from him. They scraped under his nails. They got like a hair follicle. And they went and they confirmed his alibi. And it turns out that he was not involved at all. So they crossed Steve off as a suspect and they move on with their investigation. I guess Steve and Mackenzie actually sat together and they were like racking their brains trying to figure out who might have done this to Marty. They were trying to be little detectives themselves. They remembered that like their Mackenzie, her grandma's house had been broken into not that long before. So they were wondering if maybe that could be connected if like their family was being targeted, something like that. And the only other thing that Steve could think of that could be kind of strange is that he remembered Marty telling him that she had had some work done in her house, like uh, maybe a month before her attack. And he called the cops to tell him this, left him a voicemail and all that. Like they were really trying to solve Marty's case. Now, all of that might've seemed kind of random to include, right? The fact that they were trying to solve the case and the fact that they were talking about the break-in and the handyman. Well, it's not that random because Shirley, Marty's mom, you remember Shirley told police about Steve. Well, that wasn't the only person that Shirley told police about because apparently recently, not super recently, but in the past, Shirley had had some work done in her home. She had had like stucco put up, blah, blah, blah. And she had worked with a company called B and J construction. And she had been happy with this work. She had worked with this company and one of the people in particular a couple of times. So when Marty needed some work done in her house, she referred Marty to this company. And now that I think about it, I wonder if this grandma is the same grandma that had her house broken into. Because remember Mackenzie and Steve were like looking into it and remember that she one of the grandma's houses had been robbed. I wonder if it was the same grandma and if the break-in actually is related. Now, I guess the supervisor of the construction company was a guy. His name was Brian. and He was a nice guy, a hard worker, a family man. Shirley had worked with him for like two years on and off at this point. Um, and she had had good experiences with him. She had spent time with him. She had actually met his family. It was a whole thing. And then on top of that, the most important thing is he did good work. So when Marty needed some work done, she happily recommended him. So she was telling police about this, not because she thought he could be involved, because, but because she was like, well, he had been in the house in the last month. Maybe he knows something we don't. Maybe Marty had a guest. Maybe she had a boyfriend I didn't know about. And this guy might know something. So Brian, Brian Pennington, he was 26 years old. He was married. He had two kids and he lived about an hour and a half away from Marty in a place called Leeton, Missouri. So two nights after the attack on September 10th, 2010, police drive on over to Brian's house. When they get there, they see that it's pretty dark, pretty secluded. But the one thing that they notice is that in his driveway, he had a beat up red pickup truck. 
remember the neighbor saw a red pickup truck. So they go to the door, they knock, they announce themselves. And Brian's like, oh, okay, cool, fine, sure. Invite them in. And they go and they all head to his kitchen. They noted that he was very polite. He was very cooperative. They asked him about the truck in his driveway. And he was like, oh, yeah, I, I don't drive that truck because, like, it doesn't have plates on it, so I don't drive it. And they asked him, you know, about Marty. Like, how long did you work for her? And he was like, I don't know, like, three or four days. And they asked him how he felt when he heard that she had been attacked because it had been on the news. And he said he didn't really know how to feel because he didn't know much information about it, but that he just knew that she was, like, a really, really decent lady. He just told police he hadn't really heard the specifics of what had happened. He had just seen Marty's mom on the news and saw photos of her home. So he knew that something happened. And all of this seems, you know, fine. Seems normal. Except the fact that police notice right away, like as soon as they see him, they notice this, that he has scratches on his face. So they look at him and they're like, where'd you get those scratches, bro? And he's like, oh, 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 these, these old things. That was from my dog. He had a pit bull and apparently it was a big old girl and she would jump up on him and she would scratch him. And he said that the day before, I believe he had gone outside to unchain her because he and his wife kept their dog chained up in the yard and she had jumped up on him and she had scratched him a little bit. Now the officer looked at the scratches and didn't say out loud, but mentally was like, those are definitely not pit bull scratches, but whatever you say, bro. So they just straight up asked him like directly, did you attack Marty? And he was, you know, flabbergasted, taken aback, like what? Me? Absolutely no, bitch. I would never. Brian looked at them and was like, listen, guys, I am broke as shit. I am so broke. Look at all these bills piling up. I don't have the money to pay my utilities. They're about to get shut off. I definitely don't have the money to put gas in my tank to drive an hour and a half to Marty's house to randomly attack her. Like, that's just not my back. So they're like, okay, okay. We're going to just corroborate this with your wife. So they go to his wife. Her name's Jessica. And they're like, was your husband home at the time that Marty was attacked? And she's like, yes. He's been home nonstop for the last week, the last two weeks, actually. He has not left my side. He's been at home. He hasn't been working. And he last worked at Marty's house about a month ago, and he hasn't been there since. So I don't know. We're cool here. She added that he definitely wouldn't have been able to leave while she was like asleep because she cannot sleep without feeling him next to her because, you know, she gets scared. I'm the same way. I can't sleep without my husband being next to me or being in the house. Um, Sometimes he tries to stay out in the living room and I'm like, bro, please come to sleep with me because I can't, I need to feel you. But he's like, I'm going to stay up and I'm going to play video games. And I'm like, fine, but he has to be in the house for sure. And then the officer asks her about like the scratches on his face. And she's like, they're from the dog. I swear. it." Now the cops, they didn't believe Jessica. They didn't think she was being malicious as much as she was being naive. She was only like 20 years old at the time and had two kids with him. So they believed that she was just saying whatever she needed to say at that time, whatever was necessary to make sure that he wasn't taken away from her and her kids. Now, I don't know if she really believed he wasn't involved at this point. She did say that she didn't believe he had the heart to do something like this. And I feel like a lot of people would feel like their partner doesn't have the heart to do something like this because then you wouldn't want to be with somebody like that. You want to be with somebody who's not a fucking human piece of garbage. But the cops told her after, like, okay, after it was corroborated, they were like, okay, well, we're going to figure out what happened here. And she's like, it wasn't Brian. And then she said that, like, she was just scared. She was just scared because she had never been in a situation like this, which is reasonable because I feel like most people aren't questioned about an attempted murder. That would already be scary. And then if it was an attempted murder and you're being questioned about your husband, that would be extra scary. And the officer told her, like, don't be scared. You have nothing to be scared about if you're telling the truth. And she just said she was scared for her and her kid because Brian had worked in that house. Anyways, before police leave, they asked Brian, like, hey, if we were to search your house, would we find any clothes with blood on them? And he was like, absolutely not. Of course you wouldn't. So they're like, okay, well, would you mind if we look? And surprisingly, he allows them. He allows them to search his home. So the officer makes a beeline for the laundry hamper, starts digging through, pulling out pieces of clothes. And towards the bottom, he finds a pair of jeans that clearly have blood on them. So they bring these jeans over to Brian. They show it to him and they're like, this definitely looks like blood, my guy. And he's like, absolutely not. That is definitely grease because as, as you know, as I know, I am a hard working man. And at this point, they're like, I don't really think so, but how are we going to get these jeans out of this house? Right? We need to get his permission, but is he going to give us his permission? Why would he ever do something like that? And I was like, why would they need permission? This, this feels like finding jeans that look to be covered in blood feels like it could fall under probable cause, but you know, I'm not a cop. I'm not an attorney. So they're like, I guess like the worst, we could just ask him. Like the worst he could do is say no. So let's just ask him. So they ask if they can take these jeans so they can have them tested for blood. And in a huge Shyamalan twist to them, he said yes. He told them they could take his jeans, his shoes. They could take his DNA, like a swab of his DNA. And could take photos of his face and his scratches. 
He even signed a consent form allowing them to take these items. And this just surprises me. I don't know what he was thinking. Like, did he think that being helpful would make them go, you know, we don't really need to test these. Look at how helpful he's being. This is going to be a waste of our money to test these and a waste of our time because clearly he's just a kind and helpful person. But like, no, bro, that's definitely not what happened here. The officers leave his home and they drive straight to the crime lab. They get there at about 11 p.m. They turn in their items and it only takes them 30 minutes to get a result. Obviously, they don't get like a DNA result because that takes more time. But they did get a confirmation that the stains on the pants were not grease. They were blood and they were human blood. Now, police sit on this information because they know that Marty is going to be waking up soon and they want to take her statement completely untaped it because they know that if they arrest him or if they release this to the media too quickly, it'll get out there and then Marty could see it. And then her statement could be considered to be influenced by the person who was arrested and that it could be less credible at court, basically. Now, they didn't have to wait super long because 12 days after Marty was attacked, she woke up and she started talking. So Marty, she wakes up and her first days in the hospital were just like a blur. She says she doesn't remember feeling pain. She just feels remembering she just feels, she just remembers feeling unwell, like she had too much medicine in her body. Now, amazingly, despite being so medicated, despite undergoing all that surgery and having a serious head injury, Marty's memory really wasn't that affected. She remembered what happened to her. And most importantly, she remembered who did this to her. So she told everybody, she told her family, she told the police, the person who did this to me was Brian, Brian Pennington. And then she told them what she remembered happening to her that morning. She said the day that she was attacked started as a totally normal day. She had gotten up early that morning and was doing her whole morning routine, getting ready to go to work. When all of a sudden she had a knock on her door, it was about 7.30 in the morning. Okay, this is, I cannot believe this happened so early in the morning. Anytime a violent crime happens in the daytime, I don't know why that's just so jarring for my mind, but it just seems like the creeps should come out at night only, but that's just not the situation. So 7.30 7.30 in the morning, she hears a knock on the door. She goes and she looks and she sees that it's Brian, Brian Pennington, the man who a month earlier had done work on her house. And she remembers thinking that it was weird. It was weird that he was there at all. And it was definitely weird that he hadn't called first. She just felt overall that the whole situation was strange because he didn't even have a reason to be in the area. So she's like, okay, maybe he's working on a house nearby. I don't know. But she says in hindsight and retrospect that she had such an uneasy feeling that she went against her instincts because she didn't want to come off as rude. But man, sometimes we just have to be rude. If you have an off feeling, be rude. I know as women in particular, we're always doing this thing where it's like situations will be weird, be uncomfortable, not always unsafe, but definitely like people say things or do things that are kind of like, mm. but we don't say anything particularly when it comes to men because we don't want to come off as rude. But be rude. They'll, they will get over it. So she opened the door for him. And at first everything seemed normal. It was a short, pleasant conversation. He said that he just remembered something in her basement, something that needed to be fixed. And he knew that she was going to be selling her house. So he wanted to make sure that she knew about this. He wanted to tell her about it. Actually, he wanted to show her. So she's like, okay, sure. And the two start heading down into the basement. She's heading in first and he's behind her and she's talking, 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 chatting away. And then she realizes that he's being kind of quiet. From here, it all happened pretty fast. She made it almost to the bottom of the stairs before like turning to see why he wasn't responding to her. And when she turned, he grabbed her by the throat and she was just like, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? But his grip was super strong and super tight and her voice started getting softer and quieter. And she kept asking like, what are you doing? What are you doing getting quieter? And this is a question, by the way, she never got an answer to. He never said anything to her. And she kept thinking to herself, like, I should know what to do here. I should know what to do when I'm being strangled. But she just didn't. And he choked her and he choked her until finally she lost consciousness. And she said of this memory, quote, I then remember waking against something and my back is hurting and I'm trying to get back up and get balanced and just still fighting and fighting and kicking and asking him to leave. And what are you doing? And just so puzzled and still so confused, you know, it just, it was all happening so fast. But then after that, I remember nothing. About four hours after this attack, Marty's boss showed up at her doorstep. And shortly after that, the police followed. So Marty had confirmed that it was Brian. And they already knew this because just a couple of days after getting the bloody jeans from the hamper, they had gotten the DNA test results back and the blood was a match for Marty. So police got their arrest warrant and they drove to Missouri 
to arrest him. And they actually end up arresting him while he's driving down a road. So basically what happened? Police are driving towards the house. When they see, what are the odds? Jessica, his wife, driving towards them and she's by herself. And they're like, hmm, okay, that's odd. So they pull her over and that's when they find that she's not by herself. I almost forgot his name, which is weird. Brian was in the car, in the passenger seat, laying all down flat, trying to make himself small so he couldn't be seen. So he was promptly arrested and he didn't seem to be outwardly shaken at all at being arrested. He didn't seem to have an emotional response at all to the fact that he was literally being taken into custody for the crimes he was, at least outwardly. We always say they showed no emotion, showed no emotion. That doesn't mean that they're not freaking the fuck out inside. I'd like to think that they are. So he is charged with attempted murder and aggravated burglary, and he is held on a $1 million bond. Now that I said that they must feel something, I feel like they, some of them don't though, right? We know that some of them don't, but I'd like to think that some of them are at least a little scared. Ah, oh. now when Brian got arrested, Marty's mom was really going through it emotionally, right? Like she knew him. She had worked with him for years. She had met his family and she's the one who referred him to her daughter. And then he almost killed her. It's just really wild to think you could interact with somebody so many times and them seem to be so normal and be anything but that. Because police believe this is a truly evil man. Because not only did he strangle her to unconsciousness for seemingly no reason, he then beat her unconscious body. They believe that he took her and beat her head into her concrete floor over and over. And then he took a knife and he slashed her throat three or four times and then just left her there to die. They believe that he fully intended to kill her that day. So can you just imagine his surprise when they show up at his house investigating her attempted murder? I have to imagine he was just absolutely shitting his pants. He was like, please don't take my jeans, police officer. I really need to change my fucking pants. Marty was alive, but she wasn't doing great. Despite having her memory mostly, she definitely had some trauma to her brain and she was restarting in some ways. Like for example, she could walk, but when she walked, she'd have to take like a super wide stance to keep her balance and her stability without falling over because it had really messed with like your brain controls everything. And she couldn't balance like standing close together. She had issues with her vision. At first, her eyes were so swollen that she'd have to physically hold her eye open so that she could see her kids when she was talking to them. And then once her vision, like her eyes were less swollen and she could see, she started seeing double. She had issues with her hearing and she had issues with just like the way her brain functioned. When she would talk about things, she couldn't really stay on one topic for a long time. It would bounce around a lot, like her thought processes would bounce around a lot. She had just really been through it. So she was in the hospital recovery. And during that time, Mackenzie, her daughter actually had her 16th birthday and she spent that birthday in the hospital with her mom. And she said there was a part of this birthday that kind of broke her a little bit because her mom like gave her a birthday card. And when she opened it, the handwriting in it just like wasn't her mom's. And she could tell it looked like somebody who was like starting over. It looked like a child's handwriting. And that really got to her. So Marty ended up spending about a month in the hospital before she was allowed, like sent home. But even when she was sent home, she required like round the clock care. And apparently Mackenzie like played a huge role in her mother's recovery because she was a child still. She was 16 years old. She needed her mother and Mackenzie needing her gave Marty sort of this sense of purpose, something to recover for. She was like, I am a mom. I have a child who needs me. Like I need to get better as soon as possible. And it really like drove her to try harder and not give up. So with that motivation, she was able to heal. She was able to heal herself physically, but what often happens and isn't discussed quite as much as the like serious emotional toll, because it's kind of like the physical stuff, the physical pain, the physical recovery is a distraction from what's going on under the surface. And as soon as like that distraction is taken away, you have to face those emotions head on and it's heavy. Like she had been through something so intense and so traumatic. Marty ended up going and staying with her mother so that she wouldn't be like dealing with this alone. But those nights are long, you know, she had to come to terms with the fact that somebody she had known, somebody who seemed so normal, somebody she didn't even think twice about trusting could just do something so violent to her. During this time, she also spent a lot of time with her pastor and other church members, and she really leaned on them to heal as well. She felt like building those strong, solid relationships were vital, like critical to her healing process, which if you think about it makes total sense because if you're having trouble trusting somebody, building strong connections with people who you feel like you can trust, like learning to trust again, seems like it would be very important to the recovery, at least the mental part. So the court, the prosecution had one goal in mind. 
and that was putting Brian Pennington behind bars for as long as legally possible. And they had a strong case against him. They had blood on Brian's clothes, Marty's blood on Brian cl- Brian's clothes. They had the scratches on his face, and they had Marty herself looking at him and saying, he did it. Now, what they didn't have was a motive. And though a motive is not legally required, like it's not one of the requirements for guilt and somebody being convicted, it's definitely helpful for a jury to understand why. And no one had any an idea in this case. She wasn't sexually assaulted and she wasn't even robbed. He didn't take anything. Her purse was right out on the table. There was even money left out that he left behind. So it was just so weird because this guy does work in her house. The work goes fine. There's no altercation. He leaves, goes about his life seemingly normal for a month, then out of nowhere, drives back to her house one morning and tries to murder her. Make it make sense because the math isn't mathing. Now, Brian, he did have a bit of a record though. Police had looked into him and seen that he had had contact with the police around 60 times and he had been convicted 26 times. And a lot of these incidences were for domestic violence issues. This was with his wife and also with women that he had dated. He was just a violent man when it came to women. And now to do this to Marty for no reason they could come up with, he was clearly just a violent man in general. A violent man to his wife? Was that why she gave him an alibi? That's what police needed to figure out because her giving him an alibi was an issue. It doesn't seem like it should be that much of an issue with everything they have against him, but it definitely was an issue because she said he had been with her the entire night. Could this be enough for reasonable doubt? Who's to say, but they didn't want to chance it. So they actually went back to her. They talked to her and they were like, listen, you need to be honest here. And then they told her everything. They told her all the details of what happened to Marty, how savagely she was attacked, how close she was to death. And it seems like that might've gotten through to her a little bit because she was like, okay, okay, I'm going to tell you the truth. What I said wasn't the truth. He was not even here the night that Marty was attacked. She also told police that Brian had been very violent to her as well. He had threatened her. He had assaulted her. She was living in fear in her own home from her own husband. Now the preliminary hearing, that was going to be the first time that Marty actually saw Brian again, like face to face. And it was very nerve wracking. She didn't know how she was going to be like actually seeing him. And the prosecution was worried about her physical health because she still wasn't in good shape. They were really wondering what testifying was going to be like for her, what it was going to be like physically, what it was going to be like mentally, and if it was worth it. But at the same time, they were like, this is a very violent man that we need to get off the street, clearly. And her testimony is going to be just <laughs> just vital. Like there, You can't even put into words how helpful that would be for a prosecutor. The day of that hearing, Brian was brought in and he was going to sit on like the far right of the courtroom. And so he had to walk by all of Marty's family, like everybody on her side to get to his seat. And it was very hard for them. It was very hard for Marty's mother to look at this man that she had known who had done this to her kid. But I have to think that it gave her a little bit of satisfaction to see that on Brian's side of the courtroom, nobody was there. Nobody was sitting in his corner, not even his own mother. Through this entire hearing, Brian sat there unmoving, un affected seemingly, but that was until Marty walked in. When Marty walked in the courtroom, he turned and he looked at her and her family said that it looked like he was seeing a ghost. Like they will never forget that look in his eyes. He just really seemed so shocked to see that she was actually alive. And now she was going up there and she was going to testify against him. She was going to tell them what he did. to her. And these were things that he probably thought no one, that they were going to be taken to his grave and to her grave. You know what I mean? Like that would be wild, dude. Now, when Marty testified, she tried not to look at him. She didn't want to see his face, but she could see out of the corner of her eye that he was staring at her. But for those that did look at him during the whole whole court, the whole court, the whole testimony, this is a good sentence. Those that did look at him said that he didn't seem phased. He seemed unmoved by her testimony. He didn't seem to be affected at all. He kind of seemed like he was off in his own little world. But I have to imagine that he was filled with some sort of emotion and brought back into reality when she was asked to identify her attacker. And she looked right at him and was like, that is my attacker, Brian Pennington. And if that wasn't bad enough, which it was, uh, his own wife, Jessica, also testified against him. She told the court that he was not there the morning that Marty was attacked. And if her saying that wasn't enough, they also had cell records. They had records of her texting him that morning at about 8 a.m. saying, where are you? Which showed he wasn't home. And his cell phone pinged off a tower at that time near Marty's house. With that, the judge decided there was enough evidence to actually take Brian to trial. So they were going for it. 
Now, Brian must have realized that his goose was effectively cooked, because pretty quickly upon learning that we're going to go to trial, his attorneys went to the prosecution wanting to work out a plea deal. Of course, they had to talk to Marty. They had to see how she was feeling, which way she was leaning. But the prosecutor looked at her and they were like, listen, it is hard enough to get 12 people to decide where they want to eat lunch, let alone get them to come to a verdict. And it's particularly difficult when it comes to first degree attempted murder. This is what the prosecution was telling her, because you have to prove intent. You have to prove that they intended to kill you. We hear about this when it comes to, uh, to attempted murder cases that sometimes, you know, that part is difficult. So that's what they're telling her. Now, I personally feel like I think at least based on what I have read that they probably could have gotten a guilty conviction on him. I mean, I could see what the defense could try to do. They could try to say like her blood was on him because she had worked in his house and that Marty was confused. She didn't know who really attacked her because she had a brain injury. I could see that. But even with that, I feel like what they have is strong enough that they could have gotten a conviction. But either way, this is what's going on. Now, I believe that the max that they could have gotten for him, even if they had gone to trial and got a guilty conviction, was less than 40 years. I saw the prosecution say 38. And that was if they got a conviction. But they didn't even end up having to do that. They made a deal. They did make a plea deal. And in this deal, he was going to serve 28 and a half years. So just, you know, 10 years shy of the max they could have gotten. And in doing this, they would have worn going to trial. Marty wouldn't have to be, you know, victimized again by going through a whole trial. And of course, you know, the state saves a lot of money. So win, win, win. But then the day of the sentencing, which was in December of that year, the prosecution got a Shyamalan twist. Basically, the prosecutor walked in and immediately upon walking in the courtroom, they knew something was wrong. They could feel it in the air. They could see that there was tension between Brian and his attorneys. Apparently, Brian looked pissed. And then she learned that Brian wanted to withdraw his like agreement to the plea agreement and go to trial. Now, he had already entered his plea, so it wasn't as easy as just being like, never mind, I changed my mind, I want to go to trial. He had to speak to the judge. The judge had to speak to Brian, and Brian had to convince the judge to allow him to change his plea. So they had that conversation, and Brian just said that, quote, I feel based on the time that has been given, and based on the pressure I've been through during this whole situation, I feel I'm giving up rights that I shouldn't give up based on the amount of time. Now, the courtroom was tense. People in the courtroom were tense. Family had spent money flying in to see him be sentenced. And now it was looking like it was possible that he wasn't going to be sentenced at all and that they were going to have to go through a trial. And this was devastating, especially for Marty, who was thinking that after today, this part of her life was going to be behind her. And lucky for them, it actually was over that day because the judge said that the reason, basically the judge determined that the reason that Brian had given for wanting to withdraw his plea agreement was insufficient. The judge told him like, When we accepted your plea agreement, we went through a bunch of questions. We made sure you knew what you were agreeing to. We gave you plenty of time to speak to your attorney. We wrote out the agreement. You read it. You signed it. It's done. And he didn't let him um, withdraw his plea agreement. With that, the sentencing hearing moved forward and people were now going to be able to give their victim impact statements to Brian. And they were ready. Marty's daughter, Mackenzie, was like, I am so ready to give this dick. I don't think she said dick, but I'm sure she thought dick a piece of my mind. She stared him straight in the face as she told him, quote, I will never understand why you did this to my mom. You put my entire family through something that no family should ever have to go through. And you put me through something that a 15 year old especially should never have to go through. He avoided eye contact with her the entire time she said that, but she said that she felt like she knew that it had sank in. And either way, she felt strength and power from saying what she had to say. The most intense part was, of course, when Marty gave her statement to Brian. She stood and she faced the man who tried to murder her. And she was like, I was nothing but nice to you, dude. Why did you do this to me? But still, he wouldn't give her a motive. He has never given a motive for why he did what he did to her. The judge then asked Brian if he had anything to say before his sentence was passed down. And he said no. And with that, Brian K. Pennington was sentenced to 28 and a half years in prison for the attempted murder of Marty Hill. Now, Marty, she's doing well, but she does have lasting effects from her injuries. She has big scars on the side of her neck. She has tingling down the left side of her body and says that her face feels like a mannequin on the bottom left and that her ear feels very tight and said, like, it feels very full. She says that it echoes when she talks and that she was told that she'd get used to it, but she never really did, which she said these things are definitely reminders for her about what happened to her. And she thinks about it a lot. Like, how could someone so young, only 26 years old, be so vicious, unprovoked? 
she said she just wants to know why, but that she knows she probably never will. And that's just incredibly sad. She has moved on, though, as much as anyone can. She's gotten to be more active. She was already active, but she's gotten to be more active, and she's actually taken up kickboxing. She was already a healthy and active person, but she thinks that this is part of why she survived. She was active, doing gymnastics for 20 years, something that she actually passed on to her kids, her daughter a gymnast, and her son a wrestler. Um, but she said it started, like the kickboxing started as something to push herself a little farther, working out, because she knew that being active and mobile was going to be vital to her getting back to regular, living her regular life. But it's also got to make you feel like pretty prepared to take things on when you can kick like a little bit of ass, you know what I mean? <laughs> She's also gone on to kick ass in other ways as well. She's created a website to help other women, other people who have gone through traumatic events. I will try and remember to link her website and Facebook page down below because I do know that Marty and her daughter are trying to get her story out to as many people as possible so that they can help as many people as possible. And I also know that I oftentimes forget to link things because I am dumb, forgetful. I have a little baby. I don't sleep very well. And to be fair, this was me before then. So if I don't remember, give me an earful in the comments so that I will see it and that I will do it. Marty said of her creation of her website, quote, I've always felt that it is important to help others. And now with everything that has happened to me, it's even more important to reach out and help others to survive, to connect with each other and with experts and to thrive in the wake of adversity. My website is also meant to serve as a resource for those who are seeking to aid a friend or a loved one who has endured a crisis or setback. Marty is also an accomplished artist based on her Instagram. It says that she has always been an artist and she used it to express herself, but now she also uses it to cope, to de-stress, and to connect with others. Marty has said that she's actually not mad at Brian for herself. She's angry at Brian for the pain that she, that her family was put through. Like they spent days worrying and waiting, wondering if she would survive. And that's what pisses her off. Mackenzie has said that she's so proud of her mom and that she feels very grateful that she's gotten the opportunity to like grow and become more like her mother every single day. She gets the opportunity to adopt her mother's personality and work ethic. And she got to learn to be strong and persevere, like persevere, excuse me, like her mom did. She said if anything ever happened to her, now she knows she would have the strength and the will to move on and get past it just like her mom did. She said that she's also super thankful that the people her mother worked for, worked with rather, cared about her mother enough, not only to notice that she was gone, but to actively try to figure out what had happened to her. Imagine if they hadn't, if her coworkers hadn't had a bad feeling, if her boss hadn't gone over there and felt that it was really weird if they hadn't called the cops, Marty may have bled out on her basement floor that day, which is terrifying to consider. Mackenzie says she believes that these people were her mother's guardian angels, and Marty herself has echoed a similar sentiment about her co-workers. Marty herself has been writing a book, and it's going to be a, quote, 70,000 word memoir of my long and distressing recovery, the hunt for my would-be killer, and the redemption I found as a survivor and now advocate for women's safety and awareness. And the title announced is Millimeter for Murder, The Anatomy of a Survivor, and I believe a butterfly is going to be on the cover because she's often seen wearing a butterfly or an image as a butterfly is like there with her because this is her symbol to, you know, represent the change that she went through as a person. She said that she's writing this book because she feels like in writing down what happened to her and walking through it, it's helping her to understand it better. Marty has gone on to be like a motivational speaker. She speaks to groups about the morning that changed her life. She said she hopes by doing this, she can help people remember to trust their judgments and instincts. And if something doesn't feel right, it's okay to say no and be rude to ask them to come back later. She said that she also wants people to realize that even though most people are out there trying to do their best, that's what most people are doing. They're trying to be the best people they can be, that not everybody thinks the same. And she just wants people to realize that bad things can and do happen to good people. And with that, that my friends is the story of the horrifying attempted murder of Marty Hill. I hope you found this video on it to be informative and I hope it made sense. And of course, I just want to thank you for remembering Marty with me today. Now, considering everything I told you throughout this video, I want to revisit the question of the day. And that was this, what do you believe was the motive for the attempted murder of Marty Hill? It perplexes my mind truly. Like part of me feels like maybe it was going to be robbery and he didn't expect her to be there, but then it was 7.30 in the morning. Why would he not expect her to be there? Then I wonder if her mother, if it was her mother, Mackenzie's grandmother's house being robbed, maybe that was him as well. Like he was hard up on money. I really just 
don't know. So let me know all your thoughts in the comments below, because I would like to see the ideas being bounced off each other because it's so perplexing to me. It's scary to think that somebody would just do this randomly with no reason at all. Anyways, guys, before you leave, please don't forget to leave me a suggestion in the comments below. I sometimes see comments from people being like, how do I suggest a case? You leave it in the comments below here. I have a long list of cases. And whenever you leave a suggestion, I put it on my list with your name next to it. So if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases you guys suggest. They're often cases I haven't heard of or cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise, you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put on a new video every single week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below, along with a link to my membership where you get early access to non-sponsored videos, priority comment responses, things like that. And now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday, and I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.